Chapter 17 of The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1 by George Sand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Melissa Marie, The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1 by George Sand. Translated by George Burnham Ives. Thaw. Emile had as yet admired the park of Boisgabau only over the hedges and through the gate. He was more than ever impressed by the beauty of that pleasure ground, by the luxuriance of the plants and their happy arrangement. Nature had done much, but art had seconded her with great taste and judgment. The sloping ground was diversified by innumerable picturesque irregularities, and an abundant spring, bubbling up from among the rocks, sent forth streams in all directions, keeping all things green under the superb trees. The valley and the slope on the other side, which also belonged to the Marquis, were covered with a dense vegetation, which partly concealed the division walls and hedges, so that from all the elevated points which afforded views of a beautiful and extensive landscape, the park seemed to extend to the horizon. "'This is an enchanted spot,' said Emile, "'and one needs only to see it to be sure that you are a great poet.' "'There are many great poets of my sort,' replied the Marquis. "'That is to say, people who feel poetry but cannot express it.' "'Is the spoken or written word alone interesting, I pray to know,' exclaimed Emile. "'Is not the painter who nobly interprets nature a poet too? "'And if that is incontestable, does not the artist who actually improves upon nature "'and modifies it in order to develop all its beauty?' does not he produce a grand poetic result? You express that very well, rejoined Monsieur de Boisgabau in a tone of indolent indifference, which was not, however, wholly devoid of kindliness. But Emile would have preferred discussion to this careless assent to everything he said, and he was afraid that his main attack had failed. "'What can I invent to vex him and make him come out of his shell?' he said to himself. "'There is no one of the famous seizures in history that can be compared to this.' The coffee was served in a pretty Swiss chalet. The exactness of the copy and the scrupulous neatness aroused Emile's admiration for a moment. But the absence of human beings and domestic animals in that rustic retreat was so noticeable that it was impossible to maintain the illusion." And yet nothing was missing, the moss-covered hillside studded with firs, nor the thread of sparkling water falling into a stone basin at the door and flowing from it with a gentle murmur. The chalet, constructed entirely of resinous wood with a pretty arrangement of balustrades and built against huge granite rocks, the pretty overhanging roof, the interior furnished in the German fashion even to the service of blue earthenware, all new and clean and glistening and deserted, resembled a dainty Freiburg toy rather than a rustic dwelling. Even the stiff, lifeless figures of the old Marquis and his old major domo gave one the impression of painted wooden images, placed there to complete the resemblance. "'You have been in Switzerland, I presume, Monsieur le Marquis,' said Emile, "'and this is a reminiscence of some favorite spot?' I have traveled very little, Monsieur de Boisgabau replied, although I set out one day with the intention of making the tour of the world. Switzerland happened to be in my way. The country pleased me, and I went no farther, saying to myself that I should probably find nothing better after taking a deal of trouble. I see that you prefer this country to all others, and that you have come back here forever? Forever, most assuredly. This is Switzerland in miniature, and if the imagination is less keenly aroused by grand spectacles, the fatigues and dangers of travel are much less great. I had other reasons for settling down on my own estate. Is it indiscreet to ask you what they are? Are you really curious to know, then? said the Marquis with an equivocal smile. Curious, no, I am not curious in the impertinent and ridiculous meaning of the word, but to one of my age, one's own destiny and other people's is an enigma, and one always imagines that he may derive valuable information from the experience and wisdom of certain men. 
What do you say, certain men? Am I not like the rest of the world? Oh, not at all, Monsieur le Marquis. You surprise me greatly, said Monsieur de Boisgabau in exactly the same tone in which he had said a few moments earlier, I am entirely of your opinion. And he added, Won't you put some sugar in your coffee? I am more surprised, said Emile, mechanically helping himself to sugar, that you do not realize how solemn and impressive your solitude, your gravity, and I will venture to add, your melancholy must be to a child like myself. Do I frighten you? said Monsieur de Boisgabau with a deep sigh. You frighten me terribly, Monsieur le Marquis, I frankly admit, but do not take my ingenuousness in bad part, for it is no less certain that I am impelled by an entirely contrary sentiment of irresistible attraction to overcome that sentiment of fear. That is strange, said the Marquis, very strange. Pray, explain it to me. It is very simple. As a young man of my age goes about seeking the solution of his own future in the present or in the past of men of maturer years, it terrifies him to see an invincible sadness and a dumb but profound distaste for life written upon austere brows. Yes, that is why my external appearance repels you. Do not be afraid to say it. You are not the first, and I expected it. Repel is not the word, since notwithstanding the sort of magnetic stupor into which you cast me, I am drawn toward you by a peculiar attraction. Peculiar, I very peculiar, and you are the more eccentric of us two. I was struck, the first moment I saw you, by the manifest dissimilarity of your character to that of the men whom I knew in my younger days. And was that impression unfavorable to me, Monsieur le Marquis? Quite the contrary, replied Monsieur de Boisgabau in that voice, utterly without inflection, which made it impossible to estimate the bearing of his replies. Martin, he added, leaning toward his old servant who bent himself double to hear him, you can take all this away. Are there any workmen left in the park? No, Monsieur le Marquis, nobody. In that case, close the gate when you go away. Emile remained alone with his host in the solitude of the vast park. The Marquis took his arm and led him to a seat on the cliffs above the chalet, where there was a lovely view. The sun, as it sank toward the horizon, projected the shadows of the tall poplars from one side to the other of the ravine, like a dark curtain intersected by brilliant streaks. The violet rays shot up into an opal-hued sky above an ocean of dark verdure, and as the sounds of toil in the fields died gradually away, the voice of the mountain streams and the plaintive note of the turtle doves could be heard more distinctly. It was a magnificent evening, and young Cardinet, turning his eyes and thoughts upon the distant hills of Chateau Brun, fell into a pleasant reverie. He was reflecting that he might venture to indulge in that mental recreation before making another assault, when his adversary suddenly made an unexpected sortie and broke the silence. "'Monsieur Cardinat,' said he, "'if, when you told me that you felt a sort of sympathy for me despite the ennui that I cause you, you did not say it simply to be polite or by way of jest, this is the reason. We profess the same principles. We are both communists.' "'Can it be true?' cried Emile, astounded by this declaration and thinking that he must be dreaming. "'I thought just now that you answered me as you did, simply to be courteous, or by way of jest. "'But am I really so fortunate as to find in you a justification of my desires and my dreams?' "'What is there surprising in that?' rejoined the Marquis calmly. "'May not the truth make itself known in solitude as well as in a crowd?' And have I not lived long enough to be able to distinguish good from evil, the true from the false? You take me for a very matter-of-fact, very cold man. It is possible that I am. At my age a man is too tired of himself to care to examine himself. But outside of our individuality there are general realities sufficiently worthy of interest to divert our thoughts from our ennui. 
For a long time I retained the opinions and prejudices in which I was reared. My natural indolence was content not to scrutinize them too closely, and then I had internal anxieties which kept me from thinking about them. But since old age has set me free from all pretension to happiness, and from every sort of regret or special interest in anything, I have felt the need of obtaining an insight into the general life of my fellow men, and, consequently, into the meaning of the divine laws as applied to mankind. Certain St. Simonian pamphlets fell into my hands by chance. I read them to pass the time, having as yet no idea that they could go beyond the bold theories of Jean-Jacques and Voltaire, with whom careful study had reconciled me. I determined to know more of the principles of this new school, and I passed from that to the study of Fourier. I admitted everything— although I did not very clearly distinguish their contradictions, and it still saddened me to see the ancient world crumble under the weight of theories invincible in their system of criticism, confused and incomplete in their principles of organization. It was not until five or six years ago that I accepted with perfect disinterestedness and great mental satisfaction the principle of a social revolution." The attempts at communism had seemed to me monstrous at first, on the faith of those who combated them. I read the newspapers and publications of all the schools, and I gradually lost myself in that labyrinth without being repelled by fatigue. Little by little the communist hypothesis came forth from its clouds. Able expositions shed light into my mind. I felt that I must go back to the teaching of history and to the tradition of the human race." I had a well-selected library of the best documents and the most serious works of the past. My father had been fond of reading, and I had hated it for so many years that I did not even know what precious resources he had left me for my old age. I set to work all alone. I learned again the dead languages which I had forgotten. I read for the first time in the original sources— the history of religions and philosophies, and the day came at last when the great men, the saints, the prophets, the poets, the martyrs, the heretics, the scholars, the enlightened orthodox believers, the innovators, the artists, the reformers of all times, all countries, of all the revolutions, and of all the forms of worship, seem to me to be in accord, proclaiming in every form and even in their apparent contradictions— one eternal truth, as logical and as clear as the light of day, namely, the equality of rights, and the inevitable necessity of equality of enjoyment, thereof as a rigorous consequence of the first. Since then I have been surprised by only one thing, and that is that in the time in which we live, with so many resources and discoveries, so much activity, intelligence, and freedom of opinion— the world is still plunged in such utter ignorance of the logical results of the facts and ideas which are forcing it to transform itself, that there are so many self-styled theologians encouraged and supported by the state and by the church, and that no one of them has ever thought of devoting his life to the simple labor which led me to certainty. And lastly, that while rushing onward to the catastrophe of its dissolution— the world of the past thinks to preserve itself by the strength and wrath of the destiny which hurries it on and swallows it, whereas those who know the secret of the law of the future have not as yet sufficient tranquility and good sense to laugh at insults and to proclaim with head erect that they are communists and nothing else. You talk of dreams and utopias with eloquence and enthusiasm, Monsieur Cardinet. I forgive you for making use of those expressions, because at your age truth arouses enthusiasm, and one makes of it an ideal which he purposely places rather high and rather far away, in order to have the pleasure of reaching it by earnest effort. But I cannot work myself up as you do over this truth, which seems to me as simple, as manifest, and as incontestable as it seems to you novel, bold, and romantic." In my case, it is the result of a deeper study and of a more firmly seated certainty. 
I do not dislike your vivacity, but I should not blame myself if I were to combat it a little, in order to prevent you from endangering the doctrine by over-eagerness. Beware of that. You are too happily endowed ever to become ridiculous, and you will please even those people who fight against you. But be careful, lest, by talking too fast and to too many disaffected persons of matters so serious and so worthy of respect, you tempt them to resort to systematic contradictions and to defend themselves in bad faith. What would you say of a young priest who should deliver sermons at the dinner table? You would say that he belittled the majesty of his texts. Communistic truth is as deserving of respect as gospel truth, since it is in reality the same truth. Let us not speak of it lightly, therefore, and after the manner of political discussion. If you are excited, you must make sure that you are entirely master of yourself before proclaiming it. If you are phlegmatic, like me, you must wait until you acquire a little self-confidence and mental activity before opening your heart to other men on such a subject. You see, Monsieur Cardinet, people must not have a chance to say that this is all folly, idle dreaming, feverish declamation, or a vision of mysticism. That has been said quite enough, and enough weak minds have given people the right to say it. We have seen St. Simonism pass through its phase of trances and feverish and disordered visions. That did not prevent the survival of whatever was viable in St. Simonism. Despite the aberrations of Fourier, the lucid portions of his system survive and will bear a critical examination. Truth triumphs and pursues its way through whatever disguise one views it and in whatever disguise one clothes it, but it would be much better that, in the age of reason which we have reached, the ridiculous manifestations of a blind enthusiasm should disappear entirely. Is not that your opinion? Has not the hour struck when serious-minded people should take possession of their true domain, and when those things that are logically proved should be professed by logicians? What does it matter if they are said to be inapplicable? Does it follow, because the majority of men still know and practice only what is wrong and false, that the clear-sighted man must follow the blind over the precipice? It's of no use to urge upon me the necessity of obeying bad laws and wrongful prejudices. Although my acts may be forced to conform to them, my mind will be only the more firmly convinced of the necessity of protesting against them. Was Jesus Christ in error because, during 18 centuries, the truths demonstrated by him have germinated slowly and have not yet bloomed in legislation? And now that the problems suggested by his ideal are beginning to approach a solution in the minds of some of us, how is it that we are taxed with madness because we see and believe what will be seen and believed by all men a hundred years hence? Be assured, therefore, that it is not necessary to be a poet or a seer to be perfectly convinced of the reality of what you are pleased to call sublime dreams. To be sure, truth is sublime, and the men who discover it are sublime as well, but they who, having received it and touched it, conform their lives to it as an excellent thing, have not really the right to be proud, for if, when they have once understood it, they reject it, they would be nothing less than idiots or madmen. Monsieur de Boisgibau spoke with a facility most extraordinary for him, and he might have talked on for a long while before the stupefied Emile would have thought of interrupting him. Emile would never have believed that what he called his faith and his ideal could bloom in so cold and apathetic a mind, and he asked himself at first if it were not enough to sicken himself with it to find himself in the company of such an adept. But little by little, notwithstanding his moderate way of speaking, the monotony of his accent and the immobility of his features, Monsieur de Boisgibau acquired an extraordinary influence over him. That impassive man seemed to him an embodiment of the living law, the voice of destiny pronouncing its decrees over the abyss of eternity. The solitude of that beautiful spot, the cloudless sky which, as the afterglow faded, seemed to raise its blue vault higher and higher toward the Empyrean, the darkness gathering under the great trees, and the murmur of the rippling stream which seemed in its placid continuity the natural accompaniment of that calm, even voice, 
all combined to plunge Emil into a profound emotion, akin to the mysterious awe which the response of the oracle in the sacred oaks must have produced in the youthful neophytes. Monsieur de Boisgebau, said the young man, deeply impressed by what he had heard, I cannot better express my submission to your enlightened views than by asking your pardon from the bottom of my heart for the way in which I extorted them from you. I was far from believing that you entertained such ideas, and I was drawn towards you by curiosity rather than by respect. But to be sure that you will find in me henceforth the devotion of a son if you deem me worthy to manifest it. I never had any children, replied the Marquis, taking Emile's hand in his and retaining it several moments, for he seemed to be revivified, and a sort of vital warmth enlivened his soft, dry skin. Perhaps I was not worthy of having them. Perhaps I should have brought them up badly. Nevertheless, I have deeply regretted that I have never had that joy. Now I am entirely resigned to death. But if a little affection should come to me from without, I should accept it gratefully. I am not very trustful. Solitude breeds distrust. But I will make for your sake some effort to overcome my natural disposition, so that you may not be offended by my defects, especially by my surly humor, which horrifies everybody. That is because nobody knows you, rejoined Emile, People look upon you as very different from what you are. You are thought to be proud and obstinately attached to the chimera of ancient privileges. You have evidently taken care with great cruelty toward yourself not to allow your real character to be divined by anyone. Why should I have explained myself? What does it matter what people think of me? For in the society in which I vegetate, my real opinions would seem even more ridiculous than those commonly attributed to me. If the cause which my mind has embraced would derive any benefit from a public declaration of my homage or my adhesion, no ridicule would turn me from it. But such adhesion on the part of a man so little loved as I am would be more harmful than useful to the progress of the truth. I cannot lie, and if any one had ever taken the trouble to come and question me during these latter years since my opinions became fixed, it is probable that I should have said to him what I have said to you. But the circle of solitude grows wider about me every day, and I have no right to complain. One must be amiable in order to please, and I do not know how to make myself amiable. God, having denied me certain gifts, which it is impossible for me to feign. Emile strove earnestly and affectionately to allay, so far as he could, the secret bitterness concealed beneath Monsieur de Boisgabau's resignation. It is very easy for me to be content with the present, said the old man with a sad smile. I have very few years to live, although I am neither very old nor very ill. I feel that my vital thread is worn out, and my blood congeals and thickens every day. I might perhaps complain of having had no joys in the past, but when the past has fled, what does it matter what it was? Bliss or despair, strength or weakness, it has all vanished like a dream. But not without leaving traces behind, said Emile, even if memory itself should disappear, our emotions, according as they were pleasant or painful, will have deposited their balm or their poison, and our hearts will be tranquil or broken according to the experience they have had. I think that you must have suffered terribly in the past, although your brave heart refuses to descend to lamentation, and that suffering which you conceal with too much pride, perhaps, increases my respect and my sympathy for you. I have suffered more from the absence of happiness than from what is commonly called unhappiness. I agree that a sort of pride has already prevented me from seeking a remedy in the sympathy of others. Friendship must needs come to seek me out, for I could not run after it. But in that case, would you have accepted it? Oh, certainly, said Monsieur de Boisgabau, still in a cold tone, but with a sigh that went to Emile's heart. And is it too late now? asked the young man with profound and respectful pity. Now, why, I should have to believe in it, replied the Marquis, or dare to ask for it. And from whom, pray? 
Why not from him who listens to you and understands you today? Perhaps he is the first who has done so for a long time. That is true. Very well. Do you despise my youth? Do you deem me incapable of a serious sentiment? And do you fear that you will grow younger by bestowing a little affection on a boy? But suppose I should make you grow older, Emile. Very good, as I shall strive for my part to make you retrace your steps. The struggle will be advantageous to both of us. I shall gain in wisdom unquestionably, and perhaps you will find some alleviation of the wearisome monotony of your life. Believe in me, Monsieur de Boisgabau, at my age one cannot pretend. If I dare to offer you my respectful attention, it is because I am capable of performing the duties that accompany it, and of appreciating the advantages of your affection. Monsieur de Boisgabau took Emile's hand once more, and pressed it very warmly, but made no reply. By the light of the moon, which was just rising, the young man saw a tear glisten an instant on the old man's withered cheek and disappear in his silvery whiskers. Emile had conquered. He was happy and proud. The youth of today profess a malignant contempt for old age, but our hero, on the contrary, felt a legitimate pride in triumphing over the reserve and distrust of that venerable and unhappy man. He was flattered by the thought that he had brought some consolation to that desolate patriarch and had made up to him for the neglect or injustice of other men. He walked with him a long time in his beautiful park and asked him many questions, the confiding artlessness of which did not offend the Marquis. He expressed his surprise, for instance, that Monsieur de Boisgabau, being wealthy and unhampered by family ties, had not tried to put his opinions in practice and to found some communistic association. "'That would be impossible for me,' the old man replied. "'I have not a trace of the initiative spirit. My indolence is invincible, and I have never in my whole life been able to exert any influence upon others.' I should be less fitted for it now than ever, especially as it would not be merely a matter of devising a simple plan of organization applicable to the present time, but we must have moral and religious formulas, an exposition of principles and sentiment. I recognize the necessity of sentiment to convince men's minds, but it is not in my line. I have not the faculty of laying my heart bare, and my heart has not enough vitality to impart eloquence to my words. Nor do I think the time has come. You do not think that it has, do you? Very well, I do not propose to disturb your conviction. You are built for difficult enterprises. May you find the opportunity to act. As for myself, I have projects for the future, after my death. Some day, perhaps, I will tell you what they are. Look at this beautiful garden that I have created. I have not done it without purpose, but I want to know you better before explaining my plans. Will you forgive me? I bow to your wish, and I am certain before that your predilection for this earthly paradise is not simply the mania of an idle landowner. I began in that way, however. My house had become distasteful to me, Nothing gratifies indolence and disgust like immutable order, and that is why the house is so carefully kept and orderly. But I care for nothing that it contains, and I may tell you in confidence that I have not slept in it for fifteen years. The chalet where we took our coffee is my real home. There is a bedroom there and a study, which I did not show you and which no one has entered since they were built, not even Martin. Please, not mention this to anybody, for perhaps public inquisitiveness would follow me there. It already besieges the park persistently enough on Sundays. All the idlers of the neighborhood stay here until eleven o'clock at night, and I stay away until the closing of the gates compels them to leave. On Monday I rise very late, so that the workmen may have time to remove all traces of the invasion before I have seen them. Martin looks out for that, don't accuse me of misanthropy, although perhaps I deserve the charge to some extent. 
Try rather to explain the anomaly of a man thoroughly imbued with the necessity of life in common, and yet compelled by his instincts to shun the presence of his fellow men. I belong to this generation of individual egotists, and that which is a vice in others is a disease in me. There are reasons for this, but I prefer not to discuss them in order that I may not have to recall them. Emile dared not ask any direct questions, although he resolved that he would discover one by one all Monsieur de Boisgabau's secrets, or at least all those in which the Chateaubrun family was interested. But he considered that he had won enough victories for one day, and that he must win the Marquis's esteem and affection if possible before obtaining his full confidence. He desired simply to obtain access to the library, and the Marquis promised to throw it open to him at their next interview, for which, however, they appointed no time. Monsieur de Boisgabau, perhaps because of a return of his former distrust, wished to see if Emile would come again soon of his own motion. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1 by George Sand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Melissa Marie. The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1 by George Sand. Translated by George Burnham Ives. Storm. From that day, Emile no longer lived at his parents' house. He was there in the body at night, to be sure and during some hours of the day, but his mind was more frequently at Boisgabau and his heart almost always at Chateaubrun. He went frequently to Boisgabau, more frequently than he would have done, perhaps, had it not been for the proximity of Chateaubrun and the pretexts afforded by his first visit. In the first place, there were books to carry to Gilbert, and although the Marquis gave him permission to draw upon the library at his discretion, he was careful to carry them one by one, so that he might always have an excuse for calling upon her. It did not occur to Monsieur Antoine or Janille to be surprised at the pleasure which Gilbert derived from reading or to superintend her choice of books, for Janille could not read, and prudence was not Monsieur Antoine's forte. But the maid's guardian angel was no more heedful of the purity of her thoughts than was Emile. His love enveloped Gilbert with an inviolable respect, and the child's saint-like innocence was a treasure of which he showed himself a more jealous guardian than her father, to whom, as Janille expressed it, Good fortune had always come when he was asleep. How careful, therefore, did he turn the leaves of a volume before handing it to her, whatever its subject, history, morals, poetry, or romance, lest it should contain some word that might make her blush. If, in her trustful ignorance, she asked him to procure her some book in which he remembered that there were certain passages that ought not to be put before the eyes of a young virgin— he would reply that he had looked through the collection at Boisgabau in vain, that it was not there. A mother could have acted no more wisely under such circumstances than Gilbert's young lover, and in proportion as the father, in his affectionate heedlessness, unwittingly smoothed the way for attempts at corruption, Emile made it his sacred and cherished duty to justify the confidence of those ingenuous hearts. Emile's opportunities for talking with Gilbert as to what took place between himself and Monsieur de Boisgabau were very rare and brief, for Janille almost never left them, and when they were with Monsieur Antoine, Gilbert instinctively, and from habit, clung to her father's side. However, she soon learned that the friendship between young Cardinet and the old Marquis was making great strides, and that it was based upon a remarkable harmony of principles and ideas. But Emile did his best to conceal from her the ill success of his attempts to bring about a reconciliation between the two families. We shall set forth in due time the result of his efforts in that direction. 
Hoping always to succeed in time, Emile dissembled his frequent rebuffs, and Gilbert, divining the embarrassments and the delicate nature of the mission he had accepted, did not press him in the fear of displaying too great eagerness and persistence. And then it should be said that Gilbert gradually became less interested in the success of the enterprise, while Emile, for his part, felt that his resolution became day by day more earnest. Love absorbs every other thought, and these two people, by dint of thinking of each other, soon had no leisure to think of anything else. Their whole existence became sentiment, that is to say, passion, and the hours flew by in the intoxication of being together, or dragged heavily in anticipation of the moment which was to bring them together. It was a strange thing to Monsieur Cardinet, who was watching his son closely, and to Emile, who no longer realized what was going on within him. And yet it was entirely natural. Inevitable, indeed, that the passion which had absorbed our hero's first youth, that is to say, the desire to acquire knowledge, to understand and take part in general life, gave place to a gentle slumber of the intellect and to something like forgetfulness of his favorite theories. In a society where all things were in harmony, love would surely become a stimulant to patriotism and to social virtue— but when bold and generous impulses are doomed to maintain a painful conflict with the men and things that surround us, the personal affections capture us and dominate us to the point of producing a sort of numbness of the other faculties. The common people seek in intoxication by alcohol oblivion of their privations, and the lover finds in the intoxication produced by his mistress's eyes a sort of filter that induces oblivion of everything else. Emile was too young to know how to suffer and to desire to suffer, but he had already suffered much. Now that happiness had come in search of him. How could he think of eluding it? Let us admit, without too much shame for the poor boy, that he no longer thought of laws or facts or the future, of the past of the world, of the vices of society, or the means of saving it, of human misery or the divine will, of heaven or earth. Earth, heaven, God's law, destiny, the world, his love was all of these, and provided he could see Gilbert and read his fate in her eyes, it mattered little to him if the universe crumbled about his ears. He could not open a book or sustain a discussion. When he had tired himself out, scouring all the paths that led in the direction of his beloved, he dozed beside his mother's chair or read the newspapers to her without understanding a word of what his voice said. And when he was alone in his chamber— he would undress very hurriedly so that he could put out his light and avoid the sight of external objects. Then the darkness would be illuminated by the inward fire which gave him life, and his radiant vision would appear before him. In that ecstatic state he ceased to have the sensations of sleep or of waking. He dreamed with his eyes open, he saw with his eyes closed. A word of playful affection, a smile from Gilbert, the touch of her dress brushing against him as she passed, a blade of grass which she had broken and which he had seized upon. Any one of these was enough to occupy his mind during the night, and no sooner did the first rays of dawn appear than he ran to groom his horse himself so that he might start the earlier. He forgot to eat and considered it perfectly natural that he should live on the morning dew and the breeze that blew from Chateaubrun. He dared not go there every day, although he might have done so without fear that Monsieur Antoine would receive him less warmly. But there is in love a shrinking modesty which takes fright at happiness at the moment of grasping it, so he wandered about in every direction and hid in the woods, where he could gaze at the ruins of Chateaubrun through the branches, as if he were afraid of being caught in the act of adoration. At night, when Jean Jabaloup had finished his day's work, 
as he did not as yet earn enough to hire a house and did not choose to be a burden to his friends, and as the nights were warm and pleasant, he repaired to a small abandoned chapel on the hill which formed the centre of the village, and before lying down on the straw, with which he had made a bed, went to say his prayers at the pretty little church of Garhiles. He went down from preference into the Roman crypt, which still bears traces of the curious frescoes of the 15th century. From the daintily carved window of that underground apartment, one overlooks walls of rock and the green ravines through which the Garhiles flows. The carpenter had been deprived longer than he liked of the sight of his dear native place, and he often interrupted his placid, pensive prayer to gaze on the landscape, still half praying, half musing, in that peculiar frame of mind characteristic of simple-hearted folk, peasants, especially after the fatigue of the day. It was then that Emile, when he had dined and walked a while with his mother, came to join the carpenter, to admire the pretty structure with him, and then to chat on the hilltop of everything that he could not talk about at home, of Chateaubrun, Monsieur Antoine, Janille, and lastly, of Gilbert. There was one person who loved Gilbert almost as dearly as Emile, but with another kind of love. That person was Jean. He did not precisely look upon her as his daughter, for, blended with the paternal sentiment, there was a sort of respect for a nature so adorable, a sort of unpolished enthusiasm which he would not have had for his own children. But he was proud of her beauty, of her goodness, of her common sense, and of her courage, like a man who knows the value of those qualities and feels keenly the honor of a noble attachment. The familiarity with which he expressed himself concerning her, dropping the title of Mademoiselle in accordance with his habit of calling everyone by his or her name, and in no wise detracted from his instinctive veneration for her, and Emile's ears were not wounded thereby, although he would never have dared do the same. The young man took keen delight in hearing of Gilbert's childish sports and pretty ways, of her kindly impulses, of her generous and delicate attentions to the friend who, but for her, would have lacked everything. When I was wandering in the mountains not long ago, said Japaloup, I was pressed so close sometimes that I dared not leave this hole in the cliff or the branches of some tree with dense foliage in which I had hidden in the morning. At such times, hunger took hold of me, and one night, when I was thoroughly done up with weakness and fatigue, and was creeping round the mountain, saying to myself that it was a long, long way to Chateau Brun, and if I should happen to meet gendarmes on the way, I shouldn't have the strength to run. I saw a little wagon on the road with several bundles of straw, and Gilbert walking alongside and making signs to me. She had come all that distance with Sylvain Charasson, looking for me everywhere, and watching like a little quail under a bush. I lay down and hid in the straw. Gilbert sat down by my side, and Sylvain led us back to Chateau Brun, where I went in under the noses of the gendarmes who were hunting for me, not two steps away. Another time, we had agreed that Sylvain should bring me something to eat and put it in the hollow trunk of an old willow about a league from Chateau Brun. It was horrible weather, pelting rain, and I had a strong suspicion that the little rascal who likes to be comfortable would pretend to forget me or would eat my dinner on the road. However, I went there at the time agreed upon, and I found the little basket well filled and well out of sight. But what do you suppose I spied near the willow? The print of a cunning little foot on the damp sand— and I was able to follow the poor little foot along the road where it had sunk in more than once over the ankle. The dear child had got wet through, dirty and tired, because she wouldn't trust anyone but herself to look after her old friend. And still, another day, she saw the bloodhounds marching straight for an old ruin where, thinking that I was perfectly safe, I was calmly taking a nap at midday. It was terribly hot that day, it was the very day you arrived in the neighborhood. Well, Gilbert took the shortcut, a very rough and dangerous path, where the horsemen could not have followed her, 
and arrived a quarter of an hour ahead of them, all red and all out of breath, to wake me and tell me to make tracks. She was sick afterward, poor dear heart, and her people knew nothing about it. That was what made me particularly anxious that evening, when we took supper at Chateaubrun and Janille told us that she had gone to bed. Ah, yes, the little one has always had a great heart. If the King of France knew her worth, he would be too much honored to obtain her hand for the best of his sons. When she was no bigger than my fist, anyone could see that she would be as pretty and lovable a creature as ever was. You may seek as you will among the greatest and richest ladies, my boy. You will never find a Gilbert like Gilbert de Chateaubrun. Emile listened with delight, asked him innumerable questions, and made him repeat the same stories ten times over. It was not long before Monsieur Cardinet discovered the cause of the change that had taken place in Emile. There was no more melancholy, no more painful reticence, no more indirect reproof. It seemed as if Emile had never been in opposition to him on any subject whatever, or at least had never noticed that his father had different ideas from his own. He had become a child once more in many respects. He did not heave sighs at this or that plan of study. He seemed not to see things which might have offended his principles. He dreamed of naught but lovely sunny mornings, long walks, precipices to climb, solitudes to explore, and yet he brought back neither sketches, nor plants, nor mineralogical specimens, as he would have done at other times. Country life pleased him above all things. It was the loveliest region in the world. The open air and exercise in the saddle did him a vast amount of good. In a word, everything was for the best, provided that he was allowed to have his way, and if he fell into a fit of musing— he would come out of it with a smile that seemed to say, I have things within me to occupy my mind, and what you say to me is nothing compared to what I think. If Monsieur Cardinet, by some artifice, succeeded in keeping him at home, he seemed distressed for a moment, then suddenly, assuming an air of resignation, like a man whom it is impossible to dispossess of his stock of happiness, he made haste to obey and set about his task in order to have done with it the sooner. There's a pretty girl at the bottom of all this, said Monsieur Cardinet to himself, and it is love that makes this rebellious mind so docile. It's a very good thing to know, so the philosophical argumentative fever may give way to thirst for pleasure or to sentimental reveries. I was very foolish not to reckon on his youth and the passions of youth. I must let this storm rage. It will blow away the obstacle upon which I should have gone to pieces, and when it is time to stay the storm, I will see what it is best to do. Make haste with your riding about the country and your loving, my poor Emile. It's the same with you as with this mountain stream that has declared war on me. You will both submit when you feel the hand of the master. Monsieur Cardinet was not conscious of his cruelty. He believed neither in the force nor duration of love, and attached no more importance to a young man's despair than to a child's tears. If he had thought that Mademoiselle de Chateaubrun could become the victim of his plan of waiting, he might perhaps have been conscience-stricken. But the spirit of a proprietor and of everyone for himself prevented him from foreseeing the danger of another. It's old Antoine's business to look out for his daughter, he thought. If the old sot sleeps on his own perils, he has at all events a servant mistress who has nothing better to do than put the key of the famous pavilion in her pocket at night. I can open the duenna's eyes when the time comes." With this persuasion, he left Emile almost free, both as to his time and his acts. He confined himself to ridiculing and bitterly decrying the family of Chateaubrun when opportunity offered, in order to protect himself from the reproach of having openly encouraged his son's suit. In his opinion, 
Antoine de Chateaubrun was really a poor creature, a man of no consideration, whom poverty had degraded and idleness brutalized. He saw with vainglorious pleasure the former lords of the soil, thus fallen from their high estate, take refuge in the arms of the people, not daring to have recourse to the protection and companionship of the newly rich. Monsieur de Boisgabau found no favor in his eyes, although it was difficult to reproach him with dissipation and impropriety of conduct. The wealth which he had succeeded in retaining gave much more umbrage to Cardinet than the name of Chateaubrun, and while he despised the Count, he had a sort of hatred for the Marquis. He declared that he was a fit subject for the lunatic hospital, and he blushed for him, he said, because of the idiotic use he had made of so long a life and so vast a fortune. Emile took pains to defend Monsieur de Boisgabau, but without avowing that he saw him two or three times a week, he was afraid that his father, by suggesting to him that he must make his visits more infrequent, would deprive him of the excuse he had for making a short call on the family at Chateau Brun as he rode by. He needed that excuse, particularly on Gilbert's account, for he was confident that Monsieur Antoine would make no comment. But he was afraid that Janille might convince Mademoiselle that her dignity demanded that she should keep at a respectful distance a young man who was too wealthy to marry her, according to worldly ideas. He foresaw clearly enough that the day would come when his assiduity would be observed. But by that time, he said to himself, perhaps she will love me and I can explain the seriousness of my attentions. This thought naturally led him to anticipate a long and vehement opposition on Monsieur Cardinet's part, but thereupon there rose in him a sort of wellspring of courage and determination. His heart beat like that of a soldier rushing forward to the assault, burning to plant his flag on the breach with his own hand. He felt that he quivered like the war-horse intoxicated by the smell of powder. Sometimes, when his father overwhelmed one of his workmen with his cold, concentrated wrath, he would fold his arms and involuntarily measure him with his eye. "'We shall see,' he would say to himself, "'if such things will terrify me, and if such a blast will make me bend when he raises his hand against the sacred ark of my love. Oh, father, you have succeeded in turning me aside from the studies to which I was devoted, in stifling all my aspirations in my bosom, in wounding my self-esteem with impunity and trampling on my sympathies. If you demand the sacrifice of my intelligence and my inclinations, why, I will submit once more. But the sacrifice of my love? Ah, you are too prudent, too discerning to demand it, for if you did, you would see that, while I am your son to love you, I have your blood in my veins to resist you. We should shatter ourselves against each other like two machines of equal strength, and you would have to become a parricide in order to win the victory. Awaiting that terrible day which Emile accustomed himself to contemplate, he allowed his father's secret rancor to vent itself in empty words against the worthy Antoine and his faithful Janil. It had even become a matter of indifference whether he did or did not allude to the doubtful parentage of the Count's daughter. It mattered little to him whether she had plebeian blood in her veins, and he hardly heard what Monsieur Cardinet said on that subject. It seemed to him, furthermore, that it would have been an insult to Gilbert's father to seek to defend him against the other accusations of his father. He smiled almost like a martyr who receives a wound and defies pain. Thus, despite all his shrewdness, Cardinet was on the wrong road and was dragging his son with him into the abyss, flattering himself that he could readily hold him back when they had reached the brink. He thought that he knew the human heart because he knew the secret of human weaknesses, but he who knows only the weak and miserable side of men and things knows only half the truth. I have made him submit on more important occasions, he said to himself, and Amorette is of no account. He was right as to Amorette's, 
Perhaps he had had experience of them, but a great passion was to him an inaccessible ideal, and he had no conception of the sublime or disastrous resolutions it can inspire. It may be that Monsieur de Bogabau contributed in some degree to allay Emile's tempestuous ardor in regard to social questions. Sometimes his tone of glacial security had aroused the impetuous youth's impatience, but more frequently he realized that tranquil prophet was right in submitting patiently to the present in view of what the future was certain to bring forth. When the Marquis discoursed to him in the name of the logic of ideas, sovereign of all the worlds and mother of human destinies, instead of irritating him as Monsieur Cardinet did by invoking the false and clumsy logic of facts, he succeeded in pacifying and convincing him. If the contrast between the two sometimes caused a sort of generous irritability in the least patient of the two, the more tranquil soon recovered his influence and disclosed the power that was concealed within him, and that made him, so to speak, superior to himself. Monsieur Cardinet's raillery had wounded Emile deeply, and had almost driven him to the exaggeration of fanaticism. Monsieur de Boisgabau's exalted good sense reconciled him to himself, and he felt proud to have the sanction of an old man so enlightened and so rigid in his deductions. As they were in perfect accord as to the fundamental points, their discussions could not last long, and as communism was the only subject capable of rousing the Marquis from his usual taciturnity, it often happened that they were silent for a long while in a sort of reverie à deux. But Emile was never bored at Boisgabau. The beauty of the park, the library, and above all the reserved but indubitable pleasure which the Marquis derived from his society made his visits agreeably restful and delightful to him as a relief from more intense emotions. He created for himself there, unconsciously, a second home, much more in conformity with his taste than the noisy factory and his father's household, managed as it was with military strictness. Chateau Brun would have been a retreat even more after his heart. There he loved everything and everybody, without exception, the family, the old ruins, even the domestic animals and the plants. But to enjoy the happiness of passing his life there, he must scale the walls of heaven, and as he must needs fall back to the earth after his dream, Emile found that the fall was less severe at Boisgabau than at Garhilas. Boisgabau was a sort of halfway station between the bottomless pit and heaven, the limbo between purgatory and paradise. He was so warmly welcomed there and so warmly urged to remain that he became accustomed to the idea that he was at home there. He busied himself about the park, arranged the books, and took riding lessons in the main courtyard. Gradually, the old Marquis yielded to the pleasures of companionship, and sometimes his smile indicated genuine cheerfulness. He did not realize the fact or did not choose to admit it, but the young man became necessary to him and brought life to him. For hours at a time he seemed to accept the boon indifferently, but when Emile was about to leave him, that pale face would gradually change its expression and the wheeze of asthma would become a sigh of affection and regret when the young man leaped upon his horse, impatient to descend the hill. At last it became evident to Emile, who was learning day by day to decipher that mysterious book, that the old man's heart was affectionate and sympathetic, that he regretted, secretly but constantly, that he had adopted a life of solitude, and that he had other reasons for taking that course than a misanthropic temperament simply. He believed that the time had come to probe the wound and suggest the remedy. The name of Antoine de Chateaubrun, which he had already mentioned many times to no purpose, and which had died away, leaving no echo, in the silence of the park, came once more to his lips, and clung there more obstinately. The Marquis was forced to hear it and make some reply. "'My dear Emile, he said in the most solemn tone he had as yet assumed with him, 
You can cause me much pain, and if such is your purpose, I will furnish you with the means, namely, to speak to me of the person you have just mentioned. I know, replied the young man, but you know? Monsieur de Boisgibau interrupted him. What do you know? And as he asked this question, he seemed so indignant, and his lifeless eyes were filled with such threatening fire that Emile, taken by surprise, remembered what was said at their first interview about his alleged irascibility, although it was said in such a tone that at the time he had been unable to view it in any other light than as a boastful joke. "'Answer me,' continued Monsieur de Boisgabau in a milder voice, but with a bitter smile. "'If you know the causes of my resentment, how dare you remind me of them?' If they are serious, replied Emile, I certainly know nothing of them, for what I have been told is so frivolous that I am entirely unable to credit it, seeing how angry you are with me. Frivolous, frivolous. In heaven's name, what has anyone told you? Be honest, don't hope to deceive me. Since when, pray, have I given you the right to suspect me of anything so base as falsehood? retorted Emile, becoming a little heated in his turn. "'Monsieur Cardinet,' said the Marquis, taking the young man's arm in a hand that trembled like the leaf fluttering in the autumn breeze, "'I do not think that you will seek to make sport of my suffering. Speak, therefore, and tell me what you know, for I must hear it. I know what people say, and no more.' They say that you broke off a friendship of twenty years' standing because of a quarrel about a deer. One of those creatures which you had tamed for your amusement escaped from your enclosure and Monsieur de Chateaubrun, having fallen in with it a short distance from your park, was inconsiderate enough to kill it. It would have been exceedingly inconsiderate, it is true, as there are no deer in this region, but that he must have known that it was one of your pets." Monsieur de Chateaubrun has always been very absent-minded, and that is not an injury of the sort for which one cannot forgive a friend. Who told you that story? He, I suppose. He has never mentioned the subject to me. It was Jean the carpenter, another man whom you won't talk about, although you have been very kind to him who told me that he has never known of any other reason for misunderstanding between you. And from whom did he obtain this interesting explanation? From the maid servant, doubtless? No, Monsieur le Marquis, the servant never mentions you any more than the master does. What I have told you is the story generally believed among the peasants. And the basis of it is true, rejoined Monsieur de Boisgabau, after a long pause which seemed to restore his tranquillity entirely. Why should you be surprised, Emile? Don't you know that it only takes a drop of water to make a lake overflow? But if your lake of bitterness was filled with such drops of water only, how can I fail to be surprised by your sensitiveness? I can discover no other fault in Monsieur de Chateaubrun than constant inertia and heedlessness. If it was a series of absent-minded freaks and gaucheries that made his presence insupportable to you— I must say that I do not recognize your accustomed good judgment and tolerant spirit. I, whom you often call a volcano in eruption, should have been more patient than you, for Monsieur Antoine's fits of abstraction amuse me rather than irritate me, and I see in them a proof of his openness of heart and the artlessness of his mind. Emile, Emile, you are not qualified to judge of such matters rejoined Monsieur de Bourgabau with an embarrassed air. I am very absent-minded myself, and I suffer for my own mistakes. Those of other people are evidently more than I can stand, you see. Affection lives only upon contrasts, they say. Two deaf or two blind men are sadly bored together. In short, I was tired of that man. Say no more to me about him." I cannot believe that prohibition is intended seriously. Oh, my noble-hearted friend, turn your wrath upon me alone, if I insist, but it is impossible for me to avoid seeing that this rupture is one of the principal causes of your sadness. 
At the bottom of your heart you reproach yourself with it as an act of injustice, and who can say that it is not the only source of your misanthropy? We find it difficult to tolerate other men when there is, in the depths of our mind, something for which we cannot give ourselves absolution. I believe, and I dare to tell you, that you would be comforted if you should repair the injury which you inflicted on one of your fellow men so many years ago. The injury I inflicted on him. What injury, pray? What revenge did I take on him? To whom did I ever say an unkind word of him? To whom have I complained? What do you yourself know of my utmost feelings toward him? The miserable fellow had better hold his peace. He will commit a great sin if he complains of my conduct. He does not complain of it, Monsieur le Marquis, but he deplores the loss of your friendship. That regret disturbs his sleep and sometimes obscures the serenity of his amiable and resigned heart. He does not of his own accord mention your name, but if anybody mentions it in his presence, he speaks of you in the highest terms and his eyes fill with tears. And then, too, there is someone very near to him who suffers even more than himself in his sorrow, someone who respects you, who fears you, and who dares not implore you, but whose affection and gratitude would be a blessing in your loneliness and a support in your old age. "'What do you mean, Emile?' said the Marquis, painfully affected. "'Are you speaking of yourself? Does your friendship for me depend upon that condition? That would be very cruel on your part.' "'There is no question of me in this matter.' Emile replied, My attachment to you is too profound and my sympathy too instinctive for me to put any price on them. I am speaking of someone who knows you only through me, but who had already divined your character and who does full justice to your noble qualities. Of a person with a thousand times more estimable than I, whom you would love with a father's affection if you knew her, in a word, I am speaking of an angel, of Mademoiselle Gilbert de Chateaubrun. Emile had no sooner pronounced that name upon which he relied as a magic charm than he saw his host's expression change in an alarming manner. The knobs of his thin, sallow cheeks flushed purple, his eyes started from their sockets, his arms and legs twitched convulsively. He tried to speak and stammered unintelligible words. At last, he succeeded in saying this. Enough, monsieur, that is enough, too much. Never be so misguided as to mention that demoiselle's name to me. And, leaving the cliff in the park where this conversation took place, he entered the chalet and closed the door violently behind him. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1 by George Sand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Melissa Marie. The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1 by George Sand. Translated by George Burnham Ives The Portrait Emile did not return to Boisgabau for several days. His sorrow was deep-seated. At first he was annoyed and angry at the Marquis's distressing and incomprehensible caprice. But soon, after reflecting upon that strange episode, he conceived an immense pity for that diseased mind, which, amid ideas so lucid and instincts so affectionate, nourished a deplorable sort of mania, paroxysms of hatred or resentment closely akin to mental alienation. That was the only explanation that the young man could conceive of the violent effect produced on his venerable friend by the adored name of Gilbert. He was so dismayed by the discovery that he no longer felt the courage to pursue so hopeless an undertaking, and determined to inform Mademoiselle frankly of his failure. He bent his steps toward the ruins one evening, depressed by his discomfiture, and for the first time he was sad on his arrival. 
but love is a magician who overturns all our anticipations by unexpected favors or cruelties. Gilbert was alone. To be sure, Janil was not far away, but as she left the house to find one of her goats, and as Gilbert did not know in what direction she had gone, so that they could not go to meet her, they had a plausible excuse for indulging in a tete-a-tete. Gilbert also seemed a little sad. She would have been sorely embarrassed to say why, or how it happened that, after passing five minutes with Emil, she entirely forgot that she had had any gloomy thoughts prior to his arrival. They had dined at Chateaubrun long before, according to a custom of many years' standing, they ate at the same hours as the peasants, that is to say, in the morning, at noon, and after the day's work, a perfectly logical arrangement for those who do not turn night into day. The sun was sinking when Emil arrived. It was the hour when all things are lovely, grave and smiling at once. Emile fancied that he had never before appreciated Gilbert's beauty. He was so impressed by it at that moment, as if it were the first time, as if he had not been living for six weeks in an ecstasy of contemplation. No matter. He persuaded himself that he had hitherto noticed only the half of her hair and only the hundredth part of the charms contained in her smile, of her grace of movement, of the inestimable treasures of her glance. He had some important things to say to her. He remembered nothing. He could think of nothing but looking at her and listening to her. All that she said was so striking, so novel to him. How redolent she was of the richness of nature. How she made him realize the perfection of its most trivial details. If she showed him a flower, he discovered shades of coloring therein whose delicacy or beauty he had never before appreciated. If she spoke in terms of admiration of the sky, he discovered that he had never seen the sky so lovely. The landscape at which she gazed assumed a magical aspect, and he could think of nothing to say except, Oh, yes, how lovely it is. Oh, you are right. Of course, of course, what you see and what you say is so true. There is a delicious stupidity in the mind of a lover— Everything means, I love you, and it would be a vain task to seek any other meaning to their monotonous agreement on all subjects. Still, although she was even less experienced than Emile, Gilbert, being a woman, understood a little more clearly what she herself felt, whereas Emile loved, as we breathe, without reflecting that a problem or a prodigy is connected with every minute of our lives. Gilbert questioned herself more and was more overcome with astonishment. She speedily made an effort to change the form of their conversation, in which, by dint of saying nothing at all, they said far too much. She mentioned Monsieur de Boisgebau, and Emile was compelled to say that he had no hope. All his disappointment reawoke at that admission, and he bitterly lamented the destiny that deprived him of his sole opportunity to make himself useful to Monsieur de Chateaubrun and to gratify Gilbert. Oh, have no fear on that score, said the girl innocently. I shall be none the less under obligation to you, for thanks to your zeal and courage, my mind is at rest on the main point. Let me tell you what worried me most. In view of the Marquis's haughty obstinacy and my father's generous humility, an intolerable suspicion had found its way into my mind. I fancied that my dear father might have inflicted some grave injury upon him, unintentionally, I am sure, and I was anxious to discover the secret so that I could take upon myself to repair it. Oh, I would have done it at the cost of my life, but now— But now, well now, said Monsieur Antoine, suddenly appearing around a clump of wild shrubs and smiling with his usual expression of frank trustfulness. What the deuce are you telling in such a serious tone? And what is it that you would repair at the cost of your life, my dear love? I see, Emile, that she has taken you for her confessor, and that she is accusing herself of killing a fly with too much temper— what is it? Come, speak out, for your embarrassed air makes me long to laugh. 
Can it be, by any chance, that you have secrets from your old father? Oh, no, father. I never will have a secret from you, cried Gilbert, throwing an arm around Antoine's neck and laying her pink cheek against his copper-colored one. And then you listen at keyholes in the open air, so you are going to be compelled to hear what is under consideration. If you find any reason to blame us, remember that you have forfeited the right to do it by taking me by surprise and criticizing my words. Listen, Monsieur Amiel, I am going to tell him everything, for it is much better that he should know it. My dear father, you are unhappy over Monsieur de Boisgabau's unjust resentment against you on account of a mere trifle. Ah, diantre! Do you propose to talk about that? What's the use? You know well that it's a painful subject to me, said Monsieur Antoine, his good-humoured face suddenly becoming clouded. You must talk about it, as it is for the last time, said Gilbert. What I am going to say will pain you, and yet I am sure that it will take a great weight off your heart. Come, come, dear father, don't turn your head away, and don't put on that careworn expression that makes your Gilbert feel so pained. I know very well that you don't want me to mention the Marquis's name before you. You say that it's none of my affair, and that I can do nothing to bring you together. But it is too bad to treat me as a little girl, and I am quite old enough to know a little something of your sorrows so that I can help you to find consolation for them. Very good. I was making inquiries of Monsieur Cardinet, who sees Monsieur de Boisgabau frequently, and to whom he has given his confidence on many important matters, as to that gentleman's frame of mind toward us. I was saying to him that to relieve you from the regret which you still feel for having unintentionally wounded him, I would give my life. Wasn't that what I was saying? And then, queried Monsieur de Chateaubrun, putting his daughter's pretty hand to his lips with a preoccupied air. And then, she continued, Monsieur Emile had already told me what I wanted to know, namely that Monsieur de Boisgabau still nourishes an intense resentment, but that we need think no more about it, because it is founded upon nothing at all, and you have, thank God, nothing with which to reproach yourself. Indeed, I was sure of it, dearest father. I simply dreaded one of your fits of absent-mindedness. But now you can set your mind at rest. Although you will be distressed, I am sure, at your old friend's deplorable condition. Monsieur de Boisgabau really is what he is said to be, and you must recognize it as everybody else does. The poor man is mad. Mad? cried Monsieur Antoine, terror-stricken and grief-stricken at once. Really mad? Have you heard him talk wildly, Emile? Does he suffer much? Does he complain? Has he been pronounced mad by the doctors? Oh, that is horrible news to me. And honest Antoine, sinking upon a bench, tried in vain to repress his sobs. His robust breast swelled as if it would burst. Oh, mon Dieu, see how he loves him still, cried Gilbert, throwing herself on her knees at her father's feet and covering him with kisses. Oh, forgive me, forgive me, father dear. I spoke too hastily. I have pained you. Come and help me to console him, Emile. Emile started when Gilbert, in her excitement, forgot for the first time to call him Monsieur. It seemed that she looked upon him as a brother, and in an outburst of emotion, he too knelt beside poor Antoine, who seemed to be threatened with an apoplectic stroke. He was so red and so oppressed. Never fear, said Emile. Matters have not reached that point, and never will, I trust. Monsieur de Boisgabau is not ill. He has the full enjoyment of all his faculties. His monomania, if we may so describe his professed repulsion for your family, is not a new disease. Only finding that strange freak in a man so tranquil and tolerant in all other respects, I believed for a long while that there must be some serious reasons for it, and I am forced to admit now that there are none. 
that it is a streak of temporary madness, which he will forget if it is not stirred up again, and that you are not the sole object of it, since other persons, of whom he has never had any reason to complain, and whom he does not know at all, inspire the same unhealthy feeling of horror and repulsion. "'Explain yourself,' said Monsieur Antoine, beginning to breathe once more. "'Who are these other persons?' "'Why, Jean, for one,' replied Emile, "'you know very well that he has no reason to dread his presence as he does, "'and that excellent man is entirely at sea as to any possible cause of ill-will the Marquis can have toward him. "'He has no reason to reproach him, nor anyone else, but I know very well what he imagines. "'Go on. If Jean is the only other one, the Marquis is not mad in the least degree.' He is simply unjust or mistaken as to our friend the carpenter, but it is as impossible to convince him of his mistake as to close the wound that is bleeding in his heart. Poor Boisgabau! Ah, Gilbert, I would gladly sacrifice my life to enable him to forget the past. Let us say no more about it. One more word, said Gilbert, for that word will enlighten you, father. Jean Japaloup is not the only one whom the Marquis detests so bitterly. He has the same feeling against me, whom he has hardly seen, who have never spoken to him, and of whom he most assuredly can have no reason to complain. Upon mentioning my name, with the purpose of calming him, Monsieur Cardinet, who will tell you so himself, found that his anger sprang up afresh, and he slammed the door shouting as if he had heard the name of a mortal enemy. "'Woe to you if you ever mention that demoiselle to me!' Monsieur de Chateaubrun hung his head and sat for some moments without speaking. Several times he wiped the perspiration from his broad brow with his coarse blue and white handkerchief. Then he took Gilbert's hand and Emile's in his, unconsciously placing them so that they touched, so engrossed was he by every other subject except the possibility of their love. "'My children,' he said, "'you thought that you were doing me good, and you have added to my grief. I thank you none the less for your kind intentions.' but I wish you both to give me your word not to refer to this subject again with me, nor with each other, nor in Janille's presence, or Jean's, nor you, Emile, with Monsieur de Boisgabau. Never, never, do you understand, he added in the most solemn and impressive tone of which he was capable. Then, addressing Emile more particularly, and pressing his hand against Gilbert's with less consciousness than before of his acts, "'My dear Monsieur Emile,' he said with emotion, "'you have been led by your friendship for me to do a very imprudent thing. Remember that the first time you went to Boisgabau I said to you, "'Do not mention my name in that house if you do not wish to injure my friend Jean.' And now you have injured me myself by forgetting my injunction. All that I can tell you is that Monsieur de Boisgabau is no more insane than any of us three, and that if he is unjust to Jean or my daughter, who are both innocent of my wrongdoing, it is because one naturally includes an enemy's friends and kindred in the hatred which he inspires." Monsieur de Boisgabau would be very cruel not to forgive me if he could read my heart, but his suffering is too great to allow him to do it. Respect his grief, therefore, Emile, and do not call a man insane whose misfortunes deserve the consolation of your friendship and all the consideration of which you are capable. Come, promise me that you will not conspire together for my repose any more, for whatever you do will really be conspiring against it. Emile and Gilbert promised, trembling with excitement, whereupon Antoine said to them, That is well, my children. There are incurable diseases and griefs that one must learn to submit to in silence. Now let us go to see if Janille has found her goat. I have in my basket some apricots I have been picking for you two, 
for I saw Emil coming up the path, and I was determined to regale him with the first ripe fruit from my old trees. After Diver's efforts, Antoine recovered his cheerful humor, with greater ease than Gilbert and Emile. The latter dared make no further comments or investigations, for whatever concerned Gilbert was sacred to him, and Antoine's earnest injunction to give no more thought to the matter was sufficient inducement for him to try and put it out of his mind. But there were many other subjects of anxiety in his heart, and love had taken such deep root there that he fell into fits of abstraction more complete than Monsieur Antoine's. When he found himself on the road to Garhilas, at the point where the road to Boisgebau branches off, his horse, which was equally attached to both places, turned toward Boisgebau. Emile did not notice it at first, and when he did notice it, he said to himself that Providence willed it so, that he had left the melancholy old man whom he had promised to love as his father all alone for three days, and that, at the risk of being coldly received, he must go at once and obtain his pardon. The gates of the park were not closed for the night when he arrived at the foot of the hill. He entered and rode in the direction of the chalet, expecting that, even if he did not find the Marquis there, he would surely arrive as soon as it was dark. Having hitched Corbeau to the balcony rail of the ground floor, he knocked softly at the door of the Swiss chalet, and, as if a little breeze had sprung up with the sunset, it seemed to him that he could hear sounds inside and the Marquis's feeble voice bidding him come in. But it was a pure illusion, for when he had opened the door he noticed that the interior was empty. However, Monsieur de Boisgebau might be in the invisible room to which he was accustomed to retire at night. Emile coughed and stamped on the floor to give notice of his presence, determined to go away without seeing him, rather than pass through the door that was closed to everybody without exception. As no sound replied to the noise he made, he concluded that the Marquis was still at the chateau, and he was about to walk in that direction when a gust of wind blew a window violently open, also a door at the end of the room. He turned toward the door, expecting to see Monsieur de Boisgebau, but no one appeared, and Emile found himself looking into a small study, the disorderly arrangement of which was as noticeable as the scrupulous neatness of the apartments at the chateau. He would have considered it an impertinence on his part to enter the room or even to scrutinize from a distance the cheap, common furniture and the mass of old books and papers which he saw confusedly at the first glance. But there was one thing that arrested his attention in spite of himself— a life-size portrait of a woman, hung at the farther end of that den, directly opposite him, so that it was impossible for him not to see it, to say nothing of the fact that it would have been difficult not to gaze at so fine a painting and so charming a face. The lady was dressed in the style of the empire, but a sky-blue shawl richly embroidered and draped over her shoulders concealed the apparent deformity produced by the fashionable short waist of that period. The arrangement of her hair, in so-called natural curls, was most becoming, and the hair itself was of a magnificent golden hue. Nothing could be more refined and charming than that youthful face. Doubtless it was Madame de Boisquebau, and our hero forgot himself altogether as he gazed with deep interest at the features of that woman, whose life and death must have had so vast an influence on the destiny of the recluse. But it rarely happens that a portrait gives us a just idea of the original. Indeed, in the majority of cases one may say that nothing resembles the person so little as his image. Emile had thought of the marchioness as a pale, melancholy creature— he saw a fashionable beauty, with a proud, sweet smile, with a noble and triumphant bearing. Was she like that before or after her marriage, or was hers a nature entirely different from what he had supposed? One thing of which he was certain was that he had before him a most fascinating face, 
and as it was impossible for him to look upon the image of youth and beauty without thinking instantly of Gilbert, he began to compare the two types, in which it seemed to him that he discovered points of resemblance. The light was rapidly failing, and as Emile dared not take a step toward the mysterious study, the outlines of the portrait soon became very indistinct. The white flesh and golden hair, standing forth from the shadow, produced so powerful an illusion upon him that he thought that he had a portrait of Gilbert before him, and when he could no longer see aught but a sort of mist filled with dancing sparks, he had to make a strong effort of his will to remember that in his first impression, the only reliable one under such circumstances, there had been no thought of a resemblance between Madame de Boisgabau's face and Mademoiselle de Chateaubrun's. He left the chalet and, meeting no one in the park, went on to the chateau. The same silence and solitude reigned in the courtyard. He mounted the stairs in the turret, but did not, as usual, meet Martin coming to announce him in that ceremonious tone from which he never departed, even with the only habitué of the house. At last he reached the salon, which was always very dark, the blinds being closed night and day, and, seized with a vague alarm as if death had entered that house in which there was so little life at the best, he ran through the other rooms, and at last found Monsieur de Boisgabau lying on a bed. He was as pale and motionless as a corpse. The last rays of daylight cast a vague and melancholy reflection into the room, and old Martin, whose deafness prevented him from hearing Emile's approach, had every appearance of a statue as he sat at his master's pillow. Emile darted to the bed and seized the Marquis's hand. It was burning, and as the two old men awoke, one from the troubled sleep of fever, the other from the drowsiness of fatigue or inaction, the young man soon satisfied himself that the Marquis's indisposition was in itself of little consequence. However, the ravages which two days of illness had wrought in that feeble, worn-out frame were most disquieting for the future. Ah! You have done well to come, said Monsieur de Boisgabau, pressing Emile's hand feebly. Ennui would soon have consumed me if you had abandoned me. And Martin, who had not heard his master's words, but seemed to receive his thoughts on the rebound, repeated in a louder voice than he supposed. Ah, Monsieur Emile, you did well to come. Monsieur le Marquis was suffering terribly from ennui because you didn't come. Thereupon he told him that Monsieur le Marquis had been taken with the fever as he was about to go to the park two nights before, and had tranquilly made up his mind that he was going to die. He had insisted on going to bed in that very room, although he was not accustomed to sleep there, and he had given him instructions as if he never expected to get up again. He had a very restless night, and the next morning he said to him, I feel much better, this will not amount to anything, but I feel as tired as if I had made a long journey and I need to rest a little. Perfect silence, Martin, little light, little nursing, and no doctor. Those are my orders. Don't be alarmed about me. And as I couldn't help being frightened, continued the old retainer, Monsieur le Marquis said to me, Never fear, my dear fellow. My time hasn't come yet. Is Monsieur le Marquis subject to such attacks? Emile inquired. Are they serious? Do they last long? But he had forgotten that Martin could hear nobody but his master, and, at a signal from the latter, he had already left the room. I allowed the poor old deaf fellow to have his say, said Monsieur de Boisgabau, for it would have been of no use to try to interrupt him. But don't take me for a coward from his story. I am not afraid of death, Emile. I used to long for it. Now I await it calmly. I have been conscious of its approach for a long time, but it comes slowly and I shall die as I have lived, without haste. I am subject to intermittent fevers which take away my appetite and my sleep, but which no one ever discovers because they leave me enough strength for the little I have to do. I do not believe in medicine, 
Thus far, it has found no means of curing disease without attacking the vital principle. In whatever form it assumes, it is empiricism, and I prefer bending under God's hand to leaping and capering under the hand of a man. This time I was harder hit than usual. I felt weaker mentally, and I will confess without shame, Emile, that I realized that I could no longer live alone. Old men are like children for falling in love with a new pleasure, but when it comes to losing it, they are not easily consoled like children. They become old men again and die. Don't be embarrassed by what I say. It is the fever that makes me so talkative. When I am cured, I shall not say it. I shall not even think it. But I shall always feel it as an instinct beneath my apathy. Do not feel that you are chained henceforth to my sad old age. It is of little importance whether I live a year more or less, or whether a friendly hand closes the eyes of him who has lived alone. But I thank you for coming again. Let us talk no more of me, but of you. What have you been doing during these sad days? I have been sad myself, because I have passed them away from you, Emile replied. Is it possible? Such is life, such is man, to make oneself suffer by making others suffer. That is a convincing proof of the brotherhood of souls. Emile passed two hours with the Marquis and found him more confidential and more affectionate than he had ever been. He felt that his attachment to him became stronger, and he determined that he would cause him no more suffering. And when, upon taking his leave, he expressed some anxiety because he had allowed him to talk so earnestly, the Marquis replied, Never fear. Come again tomorrow, and you will find me on my feet. That is not the kind of thing that tires one. It is the absence of opportunities for pouring out one's heart that dries up and kills. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of the Sin of Monsieur Anton, Volume One by George Sand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sin of Monsieur Anton, Volume One by George Sand, translated by George Burnham Ives. Chapter Twenty the Fortress of Crozon. The Marquis was in fact almost well on the following day, and breakfasted with Emile. Thenceforth nothing disturbed that curious friendship between an old man and a very young man, and thanks to Monsieur de Chateaubriand's final declarations, the painful apprehensions of insanity no longer impaired the pleasure which Emile took in de Bourguibois' society. He refrained, as he had promised Anton, from ever mentioning his name, and made up for it by opening his heart to the Marquis concerning all his other secrets, for it was impossible for him not to describe his past life, not to impart to him his plans for the future, and, as a consequence thereof, the suffering, allied for a time, but inevitably lasting, which his father's opposition had caused him, and was certain to cause him at the first provocation. M. de Bois-Guibault encouraged Emile in his projects of respect and submission, but he was amazed at the pains M. Cardon had always taken to stifle the legitimate instincts of a son so well inclined to work and so richly endowed. The liking for agriculture and the intelligent understanding of it displayed by Emile seemed to point to a noble and generous vocation for him, and the Marquis said to himself that if he had had the good fortune to possess such a son, he would have been able to make use in his lifetime of the great fortune which he had destined for the poor, but of which he had been unable to make any use in the present. He could not refrain from saying, with a sigh, that a man was blessed of heaven who found in a son, in a friend, in another self, a mind fertile in invention and the means of completing in all seriousness the work of his destiny. In his heart he accused Cardon of seeking to consecrate to evil purposes the forces and the instruments which God had given him to assist him in doing good, and he looked upon him as a blind and obstinate tyrant, 
who placed money above the happiness of his fellows and his own, as if man were the slave of material things, and not the servant of truth before all else. Monsieur de Bois-Guibault was not, however, essentially religious. Emile found him always too indifferent in that respect. When the Marquis had said, I believe in God, he thought that he could dispense with saying, I adore him. When his thoughts, taking the highest flight of which he was capable, rose to a sort of invocation, which was not so much prayer as homage, he said to God, Thy name is wisdom. Emile added, Thy name is love whereupon the old man would reply, It is the same thing. And he was right. Emile could hardly contradict him. But in that disposition to insist upon the sublime character of the divine logic and rectitude, one could but be conscious of the absence of that exalted passion for the inexhaustible loving-kindness of the omnipotent which Emile bore in his bosom. But, when the facts the miseries of life, human weakness, and all the evil that is done on earth seem to give the lie to that theory of a merciful providence, and Emile became in a measure discouraged. The old logician triumphed in the superiority of his faith. He never doubted. He could not doubt. He did not need to see in order to know, he said, and the coming and going of the plagues of this world no more disturbed in his eyes the moral order of eternal affairs than the passing of a cloud over the sun disturbed their physical order. His resignation was not due to a feeling of humility or affection, for he admitted that he had never been able to reconcile himself to his own sorrows, except outwardly. But he believed in a wellspring of optimistic fatalism for the universe at large which was in striking contrast with his personal pessimism, and which formed the most unique feature of his mind and character. Just see, he would say, Logic is everywhere. It is infinite in the works of God, but it is incomplete and intangible in everything, because everything is finite, even to man himself, although he is the most impressive reflection of the infinite on this little earth. No man can understand infinite wisdom except as an abstract idea, for, if he looks within himself and about him, he cannot grasp it or fix it in his mind in any way. You often call me a logician. I accept the name. I love logic and cultivate it. I have a tremendous craving for it, and I care for nothing that is not akin to it. But am I logical in my acts and my instincts? Less than any one on earth. The more I test myself, the more conscious I am of the abyss of contradictions, the chaotic confusion within me. Oh, very good. I am a special example of what man is in general. And the more illogical I am in my own eyes, the more strongly I feel that the logic of God is soaring over my poor feeble head, which would go astray without that celestial compass, and would foolishly hold the earth responsible for its own weakness. Once he took a meal into the country, and they explored, on horseback, the Marquis's vast estates. Emile was struck by the small income produced by such territorial wealth. All these farms are led at the lowest possible price said the Marquis. When one is unable to escape from the present economical notions, the best he can do is to bear as lightly as possible on the hard-working cultivator of the soil. These people are grateful to me, as you see, and wish me long life. God save the mark. They consider me very kind, although they do not much like my face. They do not know that I do not care for them, as they understand the word, and that I see in them only victims whom I cannot save, but whose executioner I do not choose to be. I know very well that, under logical legislation, this estate should produce a hundred times as much as it does. My dissatisfaction is allied when I think of it, but in order to think of it and sustain myself with the certainty that it will some day be the instrument of the voluntary labor of a multitude of prudent men, I must avoid seeing it in its present state for this spectacle saddens me and turns me cold. For this reason I very rarely expose myself to it. It was, in fact, about two years since Monsieur de Bois-Guibault had visited his farms and made the circuit of his domain. He could make up his mind to do it only in case of absolute necessity. He was greeted everywhere with demonstrations of respect and affection which were not without a touch of superstitious terror, for his solitude and eccentric habits had given him the reputation of a sorcerer with many peasants. Many a time, during a storm, they had said sadly, Ah, oh, 
if Monsieur de Boigabalt chose to prevent the hail, he could do it. But instead of doing what he can, he is always looking for something else that no one knows and that he will never find, perhaps. Well, Emile, what would you do with all this if it were yours? said the Marquis as they rode home. For in asking you to make this tiresome round of visits with me, I had no other purpose than to question you. I would try, Emile replied warmly. Of course, said the Marquis. I would try to found a genuine commune if I could. But I should try in vain. I should fail. And you too, perhaps? What does it matter? That is the generous, insane cry of youth. What does it matter if you fail, providing only that you are doing something, eh? You yield to a craving for activity and do not see the obstacles. There are obstacles, however. And the worst of all is this, that there are no men. In that sense, your father is right in appealing to a brutal, yet none the less powerful fact. Men's minds are not ripe. Their hearts are not well disposed. I see much land and many arms, but I do not see a single mind detached from the ego which governs the earth. A little more time, Emile, for the idea to bloom and spread. It will not be so long as people think. I shall not see it, but you will. Be patient, therefore. What do you mean? Does time do anything without us? No, but it will do nothing without us all. There are times when one should be consoled for not being at work, if one is learning. Then comes a time when one can learn and work at the same time. Do you feel that you are strong? Very. So much the better. And I believe it. Well, Emile, we will talk some day, soon perhaps, in my next attack of fever, when my pulse beats a little faster than it does today. In such conversations as this, Emile found strength to live through the hours that he could not pass with Gilbert. There was something lacking in his friendship with Monsieur de Boigabault. It was the being able to speak to him of her and to tell him of his love. But there is in happy love a something superb which can do very well without advice of others. And the time when Emile would feel the need of complaining and of seeking a support under the burden of despair had not yet arrived. In what did this happiness consist, do you ask? In the first place, he was in love. That is almost enough for him who loves dearly. And then he knew that he was loved, although he had never dared to ask the question, and she would have dared even less to tell him so. Meanwhile, clouds were gathering on the horizon, and Emile was destined to feel the approach of the storm. One day Genil said to him as he was leaving Chateaubriand, don't come again for three or four days. We have some business to attend to in the neighborhood, and we shall be away. Emile turned pale. He thought that he was receiving his sentence, and he hardly had strength to ask what day the family would have returned to its penance. Oh, toward the end of the week, I suppose, said Genille. Indeed, it is probable that I shall stay here. I am too old to run about over mountains, and you might come in as you ride by, and... Ask if Monsieur Anton and his daughter have returned. You will allow me, then, to call upon you, said Emile, striving to conceal his mortal suffering. Why not, if your heart bids you, replied the little old woman, drawing herself up with an air in which the distrustful Emile fancied that he could detect a touch of malice. I am not afraid of being compromised. It's all over, thought Emile. My assiduity has been observed and although Monsieur Anton and his daughter have no suspicion as yet, Genille has made up her mind to turn me out. Her power here is absolute, and the critical moment has arrived. Well, Mademoiselle Genille, he said, I will come to see you tomorrow. I shall take great pleasure in talking with you. How well that happens, said Genille. I am very anxious to talk, too. But I have some flax to pick tomorrow, and I shall not expect you until the next day. That is understood. I shall be at home all day. Don't fail to come. Good night, Monsieur Emile. We will have a good friendly talk. Ah, oh, you see, I too am very fond of you. There was no longer any doubt in Emile's mind. The housekeeper at Chateaubriand had opened her eyes to his love. Some officious neighbor was beginning to be surprised to see him so often on the road to the ruins. 
and Han knew nothing as yet, nor Gilbert, for the latter, when she told him that her father was going away for a few days, could not have foreseen that Janille would arrange for her to go with him. The shrewd housekeeper had laid her plans well, first to get Emile out of the way, and then to arrange for Gilbert to go away unexpectedly, thus making sure of a few days in which to avert the little outbreak which she anticipated on the young man's part. "'Well, then, I must speak,' said Emile to himself. "'Why should I recoil from the inevitable end of my secret aspirations? "'I will tell her loyal governess and her excellent father "'that I love her and aspire to her hand. "'I will ask for a little time to broach the subject to my father "'and come to an understanding with him as to my choice of a career, "'for I have made none as yet, and my fate must be decided. "'There will be a fierce struggle, but I shall be strong, for I love. "'It is not a question of myself alone.' so I shall have invincible courage, I shall have the gift of persuasion, I shall carry the day. Despite all this confidence, Emile passed the night in horrible perplexity. He imagined the conversation he was about to have with Janille, and he could have written out the questions and answers, so well he knew the little woman's self-possession and outspokenness. Ah, but you must speak to your father first of all, monsieur, she would surely say, and have an understanding with him for it is quite useless to disturb Monsieur Anton's mind with a conditional request, with projects that may not be realized. Meanwhile, do not come here any more, or come very little, for no one is supposed to be aware of your intentions, and Gilbert is not the girl to listen to you unless she is sure that she can be your wife. Then, too, he feared that Janille, who was very matter-of-fact, would treat the possibility of Monsieur Cadon's consent as a pure delusion, and would forbid him to make frequent visits unless he should produce satisfactory proof that he was at liberty to choose for himself. Thus it was first demonstrated that Emile must enter upon the conflict with his father first of all, and must govern his actions accordingly, that is to say, go infrequently to Chateaubron until he had reason to entertain a strong hope of victory, or, if he had no ground for hope, to abstain forever from destroying the happiness of the family of Chateaubron by fruitless overtures. In a word, he must go away and renounce Gilbert. But it was utterly impossible for Emile to include that alternative among the possibilities. The idea of death would find its way more easily into an infant's head than that of renouncing the woman he loves into the head of a man who is deeply in love. Thus Emile could more readily conceive the possibility of blowing out his brains before his father's eyes than of yielding to his will. Oh, very well, he said to himself. I will speak to-morrow to this terrible master, and I will speak to him in such a way that I shall be able to appear at Chateaubron with my head erect. And yet, when the morrow came, Emile, instead of feeling inspired by all the force of his determination, felt so exhausted by insomnia and so overwhelmed by sadness that he feared his own weakness and did not speak. Indeed, what can be more painful when the heart has reveled in a blissful dream than to find oneself brought suddenly face to face with a cruel reality, when one has enjoyed all by oneself the delicious secret of a chastely hidden passion, to be forced to reveal it in cold blood to those who do not understand it, or who scorn it. Whether Emile should make the avowal to his father, or to Janille, he must lay bare his heart, filled as it was with a modest languor and a holy ecstasy, to hearts that had never known or had long been closed to sentiments of that nature. And he had dreamed of such a sublime denouement. Should not Gilbert, alone with him under the eye of God, be the first to receive in her heart the sacred word love when it should escape from his lips? The world and the laws of honor, so unfeeling in such cases, were to deprive the virginity of his passion of all that was purest and most ideal about it. He suffered intensely and it seemed to him that a century of bitter sorrow had elapsed between his dreams of the day before and the gloomy day that was beginning. He mounted his horse, determined to seek at a distance, in some solitary spot, the calm and resignation necessary to enable him to withstand the first shock. He intended to avoid Chateaubron, but he found himself near the ruin, unconscious how he had come hither. He rode by without turning his head, ascended the rough road where, in the howling storm, he had first seen the chateau by the light of the lightning flashes. He recognized the rocks behind which he had found shelter with Jean Japaloup, 
and he could not realize that more than two months had passed since that night when he was so light-headed, so self-controlled, so different from what he had since become. He rode on towards Ugazon, in order to see once more the whole of the road he had then passed over, as he had not visited it since. But when he reached the first houses, the sight of the villagers scrutinizing him caused the same thrill of horror and misanthropy which Monsieur de Bougabals would have been likely to feel at such a time. He turned sharply into a dark wooded road to his left, and rode into the country without any definite goal. This rough but fascinating road, passing now over broad flat rocks, now over the fresh green sward, now over fine sand, and bordered by venerable chestnuts with furrowed trunks and enormous roots, conducted him to vast moors, where he rode slowly along, content to be alone at last in a desolate region. The road stretched before him, sometimes in zigzag fashion, sometimes straight up and down, through fields covered with broom and firs, and over sandy hillocks intersected by brooks that had no well-defined bed and no fixed course. From time to time a partridge skimmed along the grass at his feet, or a kingfisher flew like an arrow across a swamp, a flash of blue and fiery red. After an hour's ride, being still absorbed in his thoughts, he saw that the path became narrower, plunged into the bushes, and finally disappeared under his feet. He raised his eyes and saw before him, beyond steep precipices and deep ravines, the ruins of Crozon rising like a sharp arrow over curiously jagged peaks of such extent that one could hardly embrace the whole at a single glance. Emile had already visited that interesting fortress, but by a more direct road, and as his preoccupation had prevented him from taking his bearings, he was uncertain for a moment where he was. Nothing could be more consonant with his frame of mind than that wild locality and those desolate ruins. He left his horse at a hut, and descended on foot the narrow path that led down to the bed of a torrent by a series of steps cut in the rock. Then he ascended by similar means and buried himself in the ruins, where he remained for several hours a prey to an intensity of suffering which the aspect of a spot that was so horrifying and so sublime exalted at times almost to delirium. Few fortresses so advantageously situated as that of Corzon were erected in the first centuries of feudalism. The mountain on which it stands descends perpendicularly on all sides to two mountain streams, the Cruz and the Sidel, which unite tumultuously at the end of the peninsula and keep up a constant roaring as they leap over huge fragments of stone. The sides of the mountain are very peculiar, bristling everywhere with long grayish rocks, which rise from the abyss like giants, or hang like stalactites over the turret. The ruins of the chateau have taken on so completely the color and shape of the surrounding rocks that in many places one can hardly distinguish them at a little distance. It is hard to say which was the bolder and the more tragically inspired in that spot, nature or man, and one cannot imagine, upon such a stage, other than scenes of implacable fury and unending despair. A drawbridge, several dark posterns and a double encircling wall, flanked by towers and bastions, the remains of which can still be seen, made this fortress impregnable before the invention of cannon, and yet almost nothing is known of the history of a place that was of such importance in the wars of the Middle Ages. A vague tradition attributes its construction to certain Saracen chiefs who are said to have defended themselves there for a long while. The frost, which is severe and of long duration in that region, accelerates each year the destruction of those fortifications which cannonballs have shattered and years have reduced to dust. The great square dungeon, however, which has the aspect of a Saracen structure, still stands in the center, and, being undermined, threatens to fall at any moment, like all the rest. Several towers, of which a single side only is standing, planted upon cone-shaped points of rock, present the appearance of sharp rocky peaks about which clouds of birds of prey scream incessantly. The circuit of the fortress cannot be made without danger. In many cases there is no trace of a path, and the foot trembles on the brink of precipices over which the water plunges headlong. The approach of the enemy could be detected only from the top of the towers of observation, for on a level with the lower portions of the buildings and the summit of the mountain, the view was restricted by other barren mountains. But today there are gaps in their rocky sides, patches of fertile soil where noble trees grow freely, often uprooted by the rising of the waters when they have reached a considerable height. A few goats, less wild than the wretched children who guard them, cling to the ruins and climb fearlessly over the precipitous cliffs. 
the whole spot is so magnificently desolate and so rich in contrasts that the painter knows not where to stop. The imagination of the artist would find a superfluity of material in this gorgeous panorama of terror and menace. Emile passed several hours there, plunged in the chaos of his uncertainty in his projects. As he had left home at daybreak, he was consumed by hunger, but paid no heed to the physical discomfort which aggravated his mental distress. Stretched out upon a rock, he was watching the vultures hovering overhead and thinking of the tortures of Prometheus, when the distant sound of a man's voice, which seemed not unfamiliar to him, sent a thrill through his whole being. He rose and ran to the edge of the precipice, and saw three persons descending the path on the opposite side of the ravine. A man in a blouse and broad-brimmed gray hat rode ahead, turning from time to time to warn those who came behind to be careful. Next to him came a peasant leading a donkey by the bridle, and on the donkey was a woman in a faded lilac dress and a simple straw hat. Emile darted to meet them, without asking himself if Genille had spoken, if they were on their guard against him, if they were likely to greet him coldly. He ran and leaped like a stone thrown down the steep side of the ravine. He ran as the crow flies, crossing the stream which bounded with empty threats over the slippery rocks, and reached the other slope to receive a hearty welcome from Honest Anton, and to take from the hands of Sylvain Charasson the bridle of the modest steed which bore Gilbert and her sweet smile, and her blushing cheek, and the joyous air which she tried in vain to restrain. Genille was not there. Genille had not spoken. How much sweeter joy seems after sorrow, and how quickly love makes up for the time wasted in suffering. Emile no longer remembered the day before, and thought no more of the morrow. When he was among the ruins of Crozon once more, leading his beloved in triumph, he broke off all the branches he could reach, and threw them under the donkey's feet, as the Hebrews of old strewed pearls upon the track of the divine master's humble beast. Then he took Gilbert in his arms to put her down upon the loveliest bit of greensward he could find, although she needed no such assistance to alight from so small and placid a creature. Emile was no longer timid, for he was mad, and if Anton had not been the least clear-sighted of mankind, he would have realized that it was no more use to think of holding in check that exalted passion than of preventing the cruce or the sedel from flowing and roaring. "'Well, I am dying of hunger,' said Monsieur Anton, "'and before I inquire how it happens that we meet so opportunely, "'I should like to hear something about luncheon. "'One guest more does not alarm us, "'for Genille has stuffed us with provender. "'Open your game-bag, you young rascal,' he said to Sylvan, "'while I go and cut a hole in the bag that my daughter has en croupe.' Then Emile will run to the house yonder, and obtain a supply of brown bread. Let us stay by the stream. It is pure water from the rock, and is excellent when taken in small quantities with a generous quantity of wine. The repast was soon spread on the grass. Gilbert took a huge lotus leaf for a plate, and her father carved with a sort of savor which he called a clasp knife. In addition to the bread, Emile brought milk for Gilbert, and wild cherries which were voted delicious their bitter taste having at all events the merit of stimulating the appetite. Sylvain, perched like a monkey on a high overhanging bough, had as generous a share as the others, and ate with the more enjoyment, he said, because Mademoiselle Genille's eyes were not there to count his mouthfuls with an air of reproof. Emile was satisfied in a moment. Laugh as you will at the heroes in novels who never eat. It is very certain that lovers have little appetite and that therein novels are as true as life itself. What bliss for Emile, after believing that when he saw Gilbert again, she would be stern and distrustful of him, to find her as he had left her the day before, entirely without constraint and overflowing with dignified trustfulness, and how he loved Anton for being incapable of a suspicion and for displaying the same open-hearted gaiety. Never had he felt so light-hearted himself. Never had he seen a lovelier day than that mild September day, never a more cheerful and enchanted spot than that frowning fortress of Crozon. And Gilbert wore that hour her lilac dress, which he had not seen for a long while, and which reminded him of the day and hour when he had fallen madly in love with her. He learned that they had set out to visit a relative at La Clouvere before going to Agaton for two days, and that, finding no one at that chateau, they had determined to make a detour to Crozon and remained there until evening, and it was only midday. Emile imagined that he had all eternity before him. 
Monsieur Anton lay down in the shade after luncheon and slept soundly. The two lovers, followed by Charleston, undertook to make the circuit of the fortress. End of chapter 20 Recording by Todd Chapter 21 of The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1 by Georges Sand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love. The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1 by Georges Sand. Translated by George Burnham Ives. Monsieur Antoine's nap. The page of Chateaubriand amused the young couple for a few moments with his ingenious remarks, but he was speedily vanquished by the longing to run, and started off in pursuit of the goats, narrowly escaped having trouble with their keepers, and ended by making it up with them and playing at foie on the bank of the cruise, while Emile and Gilbert attempted to follow the course of the Seidel on the other side of the mountain. As the torrent has eaten away at the base of the cliff in many places, they had sometimes to crawl, sometimes to retrace their steps, sometimes to step on stones that were level with the water, and all of this not without some difficulty and some danger. But youth is adventurous, and love is afraid of nothing. A special providence protects both alike, and our lovers came bravely forth from all the perils of their undertaking, Emile trembling with an emotion very different from fear when he lifted Gilbert or held her in his arms, Gilbert laughing to conceal her confusion or to forget it. Gilbert was strong, active, and brave, like a true child of the mountain, and yet, by dint of passing over a constant succession of obstacles, she became breathless, sank on the moss beside the leaping stream, and threw her hat on the grass, having to put up her hair, which had fallen over her shoulders. "'Do go and pick me that lovely digitalis over yonder,' she said to Emile, thinking that she would have time to rearrange her locks before he returned. But he went and came again so quickly that he found her still inundated by the golden flood, which her little hands could hardly gather up into a single braid. Standing beside her, he gazed in admiration at those treasures which she twisted up behind her head with more impatience than pride, and which she would have cut off long before as being an annoying burden if Antoine and Chenille had not strenuously objected. At that moment, however, she was grateful to them for refusing to allow it, for although she was little inclined to coquetry, she saw that Emile was lost in admiration, and she had done nothing to arouse it. If there are some triumphs of beauty which love cannot refuse to enjoy, they are those above all which are unforeseen and involuntary. That beautiful hair would have been a genuine compensation to an ugly woman, and in Gilbert's case it was a lavish outlay of nature added to all her other gifts. It should be said that Gilbert, like her father, was industrious rather than clever with her hands, and moreover she had lost all her pins while running, and the heavy braid, hurriedly twisted, twice burst its bonds and fell to her feet. Emile's eyes were still fixed upon her. Gilbert did not see them, but she felt them, as if the atmosphere were filled with the fire of that passionate gaze. She soon became so confused that she forgot to be merry, and finally, as ordinarily, made an effort to relieve, by a jest, their mutual emotion. "'I wish this hair was my own,' she said. "'Then I would cut it off and throw it into the stream.' There was an opportunity for a well-turned compliment, but Emile was careful not to take advantage of it. What could he say about that hair which would express the love he bore it? He had never touched it, and he was dying with the longing to do so. He glanced furtively about. A circle of rocks and shrubs isolated Gilbert and himself from the whole world. There was no spot on the mountain from which they could be seen. 
One would have said that she had selected that sheltered retreat to tempt him, and yet the innocent maid had not thought of it, nor did she think that she was in any danger there. Emil was no longer master of himself. Insomnia, alarm, grief, and joy had kindled fever in his blood. He knelt beside Gilbert and took a handful of her rebellious hair in his trembling hand. Then, as she started, he dropped it again, saying, I thought it was a wasp, but it was only a bit of moss. You frighten me, said Gilbert, shaking her head. I thought it was a snake. Meanwhile, Emile's hand was clinging to her hair and could not let it go. In the pretext of assisting Gilbert to collect the scattered locks, of which the breeze disputed possession with her, he touched it a hundred times and at last put his lips to it stealthily. Gilbert did not seem to notice it and hurriedly replaced her hat upon the ill-assured mass. She rose and said with an air which she strove to render unconcerned, Let us go to see if my father has awakened. But she was trembling. A sudden pallor had driven the brilliant color from her cheeks. Her heart was ready to burst. She staggered and leaned against the rock to keep from falling. Emile was at her feet. What did he say to her? He did not know himself, and the echoes of Croissant did not retain his words. Gilbert did not hear them distinctly. She had the roar of the torrent in her ears, increased a hundredfold by the throbbing of the blood in her arteries, and it seemed to her that the mountain seized with convulsions, was swaying to and fro over her head. She had no legs with which to fly. Indeed, she did not think of it. In vain does one fly from love. When it has found its way into the heart, it takes root there and accompanies it everywhere. Gilbert did not know that there was any other peril in love than that of allowing her heart to be taken by surprise. And, in truth, there were no others for her with Emile. That danger was great enough, heaven knows, and the vertigo it caused was full of irresistible delights. All that Gilbert could say was to repeat with a sort of terror, instinct with regret and pain, No, no, you must not love me. That means that you hate me then, enjoined Emile, and Gilbert turned her face away for she had not the courage to lie. Very well, he continued, if you do not love me, what harm does it do for you to know that I love you? Let me tell you so, since I can conceal it no longer. It is a matter of indifference to you, and one does not fear what one despises. Know that it is true, then, and if I leave you, if I am to see you no more, at all events, understand why it is. It is because I am dying for love of you, because I cannot sleep or work, because I am losing my wits, and soon shall find myself telling your father what I am telling you now. I would rather be driven away by you than by the others, so drive me away, but you shall hear me now, because my secret is suffocating me. I love you, she'll bear. I love you so that it is killing me. And Emile's heart was so full that it overflowed with sobs. Gilbert attempted to leave him, but she sat down only a few feet away and began to weep. There was more joy than bitterness behind those tears, so that Emile soon went to her to comfort her and was soon comforted in his turn, for there was not but affection and regret in the terror that she felt. I am a poor girl, she said. You are rich, and your father, they say, thinks of nothing but increasing his fortune. You cannot marry me, and I ought not to think of marrying in my position. It would be by mere chance if I should fall in with a man as poor as myself, who had received a little education, and I have never counted on that chance. I said to myself long ago, that I must make the best of my lot in order to accustom myself to a sense of true dignity, which consists in not envying others and in forming oneself to simple tastes and honorable employment. 
so I do not think of marriage at all, since it would probably be necessary to change my way of thinking in order to find a husband. I must tell you that Chanel got an idea into her head several days ago that troubles me a great deal. She wants my father to seek a husband for me. Seek a husband? Isn't that shameful and humiliating? Can you imagine anything more repulsive? And yet the dear soul cannot understand my objection. And as my father was going to Argentan to receive the quarterly payment of his small pension, she suddenly decided this morning that he must take me and introduce me to some of his acquaintances. We can't resist Chanel, so we started, but my father, thank heaven, doesn't know how to find husbands, and I shall be so cunning about helping him not to think of it that this little excursion will result in nothing. You see, Monsieur Emile, that you mustn't pay your court to a girl who has no illusions and who has made up her mind without regret or shame to remain unmarried. I suppose that you would understand this and that your friendly sentiments would prevent you from seeking to ruffle my quiet life. So forget this folly which has passed through your mind and look upon me simply as a sister who will forget what you have said if you promise to love her with a calm and brotherly love. Why should we part? It would be a great sorrow to my father and me. It would be a great sorrow to you, Gilbert, said Emile. Why is it that you weep when you say such cold words to me? Either I do not understand you, or you are concealing something from me. And do you want me to tell you what I think that I divine? that you have not enough esteem for me to listen to me with confidence? You take me for a young madman who prates of love without religion or conscience, and you think that you can treat me like a child to whom you would say, I forgive you, don't do it again. But if you believe that a genuine, serious passion can be allayed by a few cold words, you are a child yourself, she'll bear and you have no feeling at all for me in the depths of your heart. Oh, my God, can it be possible? And to those eyes that avoid mine, that hand that spurns me, mean contempt or incredulity? Haven't I said enough? Do you think that I can consent to love you with the certainty that you will belong to another sooner or later? It seems to me that love means living together forever, that is why, when I renounced the thought of marriage, I had to renounce the thought of love. I understand it so, too, Gilbert. Love means living together forever. To my mind, not even death can put an end to it. Did I not say all that to you when I told you that I loved you? Ah, cruel Gilbert, you fail to understand me, or else you do not choose to understand me. But if you loved me, you would not doubt. You would not tell me that you are poor. You would forget all about it, as I do. Oh, mon Dieu, I do not doubt you, Emile. I know that you are as incapable as myself of being guided by self-interest. But I ask you again, are we stronger than destiny, than your father's will, for instance? Yes, Gilbert, yes, stronger than the whole world, if we love each other. It is quite useless to repeat the remainder of the interview. We might describe certain interludes of dismay and discouragement when Gilbert, becoming reasonable, that is to say, miserable, once more, pointed out obstacles and manifested a pride which, while not strongly marked, was sufficiently intense to lead her to prefer eternal solitude to the humiliation of a struggle against arrogance and wealth. We might tell by what honorable and manly arguments Emile sought to restore her confidence. But the strongest arguments, those to which Gilbert found no reply, are those which we cannot transcribe, for they were all enthusiasm and ingenious pantomime. Lovers are not eloquent after the manner of rhetoricians, and their words written down have never had much meaning for those to whom they were not addressed. If we could remember in cooler moments the insignificant remark that caused us to lose our wits, 
we should not understand how it could be and should jeer at ourselves. But the tone and the glance find magical resources in passion, and Emile soon succeeded in persuading Gilbert of what he himself believed at that moment, namely that nothing was simpler or easier than for them to marry, consequently that nothing was more legitimate and necessary than that they should love each other with all their strength. The noble-hearted girl loved Emile too dearly to harbor the thought that he was a rash and presumptuous youth. He said that he would overcome any possible resistance on his father's part, and Gilbert knew nothing of Monsieur Cardinet except by vague rumors. Emile guaranteed his loving mother's consent, and that assurance set Gilbert's conscience at rest. She soon shared all his illusions, and it was agreed that he should speak to his father before applying to Monsieur Antoine. A selfish or ambitious girl would have been more prudent. She would have made the avowal of her feelings depend upon harsher conditions. She would have refused to see her lover again until such time as he should come prepared to go through with all the formalities, including the request for her hand but Gilbert's mind never entertained such precautions. She felt in her heart a something infinite, a faith in and respect for her lover's word, which had no bounds. She was no longer disturbed, save by one thing, the thought that she might become a source of discord and affliction in Emile's family on the day that he spoke to his father. She could entertain no doubt of the victory, which he was so certain of winning, but the thought of the battle pained her, and she would have liked to postpone the awful moment. Listen, she said with angelic naivete, there is no hurry. We are happy as we are, and young enough to wait. I am afraid, indeed, that will be your father's principal and strongest objection. You are only twenty-one, and he may fear that you have not made your choice with sufficient care that you have not examined your fiancé's character closely enough. If he talks to you about waiting and asks for time to reflect, submit to every test. Even if we should not be united for several years, what does it matter, provided that we see each other, since we cannot doubt each other's constancy? Oh, you are a saint, Emile replied, kissing the edge of her scarf, and I will be worthy of you. When they returned to the place where they had left Antoine, they saw him at some distance, talking with a miller of his acquaintance, and they went to the foot of the great tower to meet him. The hours passed for them like seconds, and yet they were as full of events as centuries. How many things they said to each other, and how many more they did not say. Then the happiness of looking at each other of understanding and loving each other became so intense that they were seized with a wild gaiety, and joining hands ran down the steep slopes, leaping like deer, throwing stones to the foot of the precipices, so transported with an unfamiliar joy that they were no more conscious of danger than young children. Emile pushed the debris from his path or jumped over it excitedly, one would have said that he fancied that he was confronted by obstacles placed in his way by destiny. Gilbert had no fear either for him or for herself. She laughed aloud, she shouted and sang like a bird in the air, and forgot to fasten up her hair, which floated in the wind and sometimes completely enveloped her like a veil of fire. When her father surprised her in the midst of her excitement, she rushed to him and embraced him passionately, as if she wished to communicate to him all the joy with which her heart was flooded. The good man's hat fell off during this sudden embrace and started to roll into the ravine. Gilbert darted like a flash to catch it, and Antoine, terrified by her impetuosity, darted to catch his daughter. Both were in great danger when Emile passed them, seized the flying hat on the wing, and, as he placed it on Antoine's head, took his turn at pressing that fond father in his arms. Vive Dieu! cried Antoine, ordering them back to a less perilous spot. You both received me very warmly, but you frighten me even more. 
For God's sake, did you meet the devil's goat that makes those whom it bewitches with its glance run and jump about like lunatics? Is it the mountain air that makes you so wild, little girl? All the better, say I, but don't run such risks as that. What color? What sparkling eyes? I see that I must take you out for a walk often, that you don't have enough exercise at the house. She has made me anxious lately. Do you know, Emile? She doesn't eat, she reads too much, and I have been thinking of throwing all your books out of the window if it goes on. Luckily, she seems different today, and, that being the case, I'm tempted to take her as far as Saint-Germain-Beaupré. It's a fine place to look at. We will pass the day there tomorrow, and if you choose to come with us, we will have a royal good time. Come, Emile, what do you say? What does it matter if we go to Argentan a day later, eh, Jobert? And even suppose we spend only one day there. Or don't go there at all, said Gilbert, jumping for joy. Let's go to Saint-Germain, father. I have never been there. Oh, what a fine idea. We are on the road, continued Monsieur de Chateaubron, but we must go to pass the night at Fraisling, for staying here is not to be thought of. However, Fraiseline and Confolens are well worth seeing. The roads are not good, and we must start before dark. Monsieur Cherisson, go and give poor Lantern some oats. She likes journeys, for they are the only opportunity she ever has for feasting. You will take the donkey back to the people who lent him to you, up at Vitra, and then go to wait for us with the barrow and Monsieur Emile's horse on the other side of the stream. We will be there in two hours. And I, said Emile, will write a line to my mother so that she won't worry over my absence, and I will find a child somewhere to carry my note. Send one of these little savages so far? That won't be easy. Upon my word, we are in luck. For yonder is someone from your place, if I'm not mistaken. Emile turned and saw Constant Galouchet, his father's secretary, who had just thrown his coat on the grass and, having enveloped his head in a pocket handkerchief, was engaged in baiting his hook. Hello, Constant. Do you come as far as this to catch gudgeons? asked Emile. Oh, no, indeed, monsieur, replied Galouchet, with a serious air. I cherish the hope of catching a trout. But do you expect to return to gargil to tonight? Certainly, monsieur. Your father didn't want me today, so he gave me permission to take the whole day. But as soon as I have caught my trout, please God, I shall leave this wretched spot. And suppose you catch nothing. Then I shall curse still more bitterly the idea that occurred to me of coming so far to see such a hovel. What a horrible place, monsieur. Can anyone imagine a more melancholy country and a chateau in worse condition? And to think that tourists tell you that it's superb and that nobody should live on the cruise without going to see Croissant. Unless there are fish in this stream, I'll be hanged if you ever catch me here again. But I have no faith in their stream. This clear water is detestable for angling and the constant noise makes your headache. I am sick with it. I see that you haven't had a very pleasant walk, said Gilbert, who had never seen Galichet's absurd face before, and who was sorely tempted to laugh at his prosaic scorn. But you must agree that these ruins are very impressive. At all events, they are unique. Have you been up in the great tower? God forbid, mademoiselle, replied Galichet, flattered by Gilbert's attention, and gazing at her with his wide-open round eyes, which were extraordinarily far apart and separated by a curious little bunch of sandy eyebrows. I can see the interior of the barrack from here, as it is open on all sides like a lantern, and I don't think it's worth the trouble of breaking one's neck. And taking Gilbert's smile for approval of his stinging satire, he added, in a tone which he considered jocose and clever. A fine country, on my word! Not even Dogtooth will grow here. If the Moorish kings were no better housed than that, I congratulate them. 
Those fellows had vile taste, and they must have cut a curious figure. Doubtless they wore clogs and ate with their fingers. That is a very wise historical commentary, said Emile to Gilbert, who was biting her handkerchief to avoid laughing outright at Monsieur Galouchet's knowing tone and comical countenance. Oh, I see that Monsieur is very sarcastic, she replied. He is entitled to be, as he comes from Paris, where everybody is witty and has fine manners, while here he is among savages. I cannot say that at this moment, retorted Galouchet, shooting a killing glance at the fair Gilbert, whom he found very much to his liking. But frankly, this province is a little behind the times. The people are very dirty. Look at those barefooted, ragged children. In Paris, everybody has shoes, and those who haven't don't go out on Sunday. I tried to get something to eat at a house today. There was nothing except black bread that a dog wouldn't eat, and goat's milk that smelt decidedly rank. Those people have no shame to live so miserably. May it not be that they are too poor to do better, said Gilbert, disgusted by Monsieur Galouchet's aristocratic tone. It is rather because they are too lazy, he replied, somewhat bewildered by that suggestion which had not occurred to him. What do you know about it, pray, retorted Gilbert with an indignation which he did not understand. This young woman is very piquant, he thought and her little air of determination pleases me immensely. If I should talk to her long, I would show her that I am no blockhead of a provincial. Well, said Emile to Gilbert, while Constant hunted for worms under the stones in order to bait his hook, you have seen the features of a perfect idiot. I am afraid he is more conceited than foolish, she replied. Come, come, children, you are not indulgent observed honest Antoine. That young man is not handsome, I agree, but he seems to be a good fellow, and Monsieur Cardenet is well satisfied with him. He is very obliging and has offered several times to do little favors for me. Indeed, he once gave me a very nice line, such as we can't find hereabout. Unfortunately, I lost it before I went home, so that Janelle scolded me that day almost as much as she did the day I lost my hat. By the way, Monsieur Galouchet, he added, raising his voice, you promised to come to fish in our neighborhood. I don't disturb my fish very much. I haven't your patience, so that you are likely to find some. I count upon seeing you one of these days. Come to breakfast at the house, and then I will take you to a good place. There are plenty of barbells and they are good sport. You are too kind, monsieur, said Galouchet. I will certainly come some Sunday, since you are pleased to overwhelm me with your courtesy. And Galouchet, enchanted to have perpetrated that sentence, bowed as gracefully as he could, and took his leave, after Emile had given him his message for his parents. Gilbert was somewhat disposed to find fault with her father for such excessive benevolence to so dull and unattractive a subject, but she was too kind-hearted herself not to overcome her repugnance very quickly, and in a moment she had ceased to think of it, the more readily because on that day it was impossible for her to feel vexed at anything. Thanks to their frame of mind, our lovers found all the incidents of the remainder of their journey agreeable and amusing. Monsieur Antoine's old horse, hitched to a sort of open buggy, which he was justified in calling his wheelbarrow, performed prodigies of skill and courage in the shocking roads that they had to follow to reach their destination. The vehicle had room for three persons, and Sylvain Cherasson, seated in the middle, drove the peaceful and turned superlatively, to use his own expression. The horrible jolting of a carriage so poorly hung in no wise disturbed Gilbert and her father, who were accustomed to occasional discomfort, and never allowed their plans to be disarranged by the weather or the state of the roads. Emile rode in front on horseback to give warning and to help them to alight when the road became too dangerous. Then, when they came out on the soft sandy soil of the moors, 
he dropped behind to chat with the others and, above all, to look at Gilbert. Never was Dandy in the Bois de Boulogne darting his eyes into his triumphant mistress's superb galèche, so happy and so proud as Emile, as he followed the lovely country girl whom he adored, along the ill-defined roads of that desert by the light of the first stars. What did it matter to him whether she was seated on a sort of litter drawn by a sorry nag or in a fine carriage? whether she was dressed in silk and velvet or in a faded calico. She wore torn gloves which showed the tips of her pink fingers resting on the back of the wagon. To save her Sunday scarf, she had folded it and placed it on her knee. Her graceful figure, slender and willowy, was even more graceful without it. The soft evening breeze seemed to caress with zest her alabaster neck. Emile's breath mingled with the breezes, and he was bound like the slave to the chariot of the conqueror. There was one time when the vehicle, owning to Sylvain's lack of caution, stopped short and nearly came in collision with Emile's horse's head. Monsieur Sacrepin had placed one paw on the step to signify that he was tired and that they must take him inside. Monsieur Antoine alighted to seize him by the skin of his neck and toss him in on the floor of the wagon, for the poor beast no longer had enough spring in his legs to jump so high. Meanwhile, Gilbert patted Corbeau's nose and passed her little hand through his black mane. Emile felt that his heart was beating as if a magnetic current conveyed her caresses to him. He was on the point of making some remark concerning Corbeau's happiness, as naive as those galichets would have been likely to make on such an occasion. But he contented himself with being stupid silently. One is so happy when, having no lack of wit, he is conscious of an attack of such stupidity. It was quite dark when they reached Fresseline. The trees and rocks had become simply black masses, whence the solemn and majestic roar of the stream came forth. A delicious lassitude and the cool night air cast Emile and Gilbert into a sort of blissful drowsiness. They had before them the whole of the next day, a whole century of happiness. The inn at which they alighted, and which was the best in the village, had only two beds in two different rooms. They decided that Gilbert should have the better room, and that Monsieur Antoine and Emile should share the other each taking a mattress. But when they came to inspect the beds, they found that there was but one mattress to each, and Emile took childish pleasure in the thought of sleeping on the straw in the barn. This arrangement, which threatened Cherisson with a like fate, seemed sorely to displease the page of Chateaubriand. That young man liked his comfort, especially when he was traveling. Being accustomed to attend his master in all his journeys, he made amends for the austere regime of Chanel at Chateaubriand by eating and sleeping to his heart's content when away from home. Monsieur Antoine, making sport of him with a rough sort of gaiety, overlooked all his whims and made himself his slave, talking to him as to a negro all the while. Thus, while Sylvain made a pretense of grooming the horse and harnessing him, it was always his master who handled the curry comb and lifted the shafts. If the child fell asleep while driving, Antoine would rub his eyes, pick up the reins, and struggle against sleep rather than wake his page. If there were only one portion of meat at supper, Monsieur Antoine would say to Cherisson, as he feasted his eyes on the appetizing dish, You may share the bones with Monsieur Sacrepant. But the good man would, almost unconsciously, gnaw the bones himself, and leave the best piece for Sylvain. Thus the crafty urchin knew his master's ways, and the more he was threatened with having to go hungry and work and lose his sleep, the more surely he relied on his lucky star. However, when he saw that Monsieur Antoine paid no attention to the matter of his sleeping accommodations, and that Emile was content with the straw, he began, while he was serving the supper, to yawn and stretch, and to observe that they had a long journey, that infernal place was at the world's end, and that he had really thought they would never get there. 
Antoine turned a deaf ear to it all, and although the supper was far from dainty, ate with excellent appetite. This is how I like to travel, he said, clinking his glass against Emile's every other minute, as a consequence of the habit he had fallen into with Jean Jepelou. When I have all the comforts and everybody I love with me, don't talk to me about taking long journeys in a post-chaise or on a ship wandering about the world alone and miserable in quest of fortune. It's very nice to enjoy the little money one may have riding about a beautiful region where you know everybody you meet by name and every house, every tree, and every rut. Am I not just as comfortable here as at home? If I had Jean and Janelle at the table, I should think it was Chateaubriand, for I have my daughter here and one of my best friends and my dog, too, and even Monsieur Cherasson, who is as pleased as a king to see the world and be quartered according to his deserts. It pleases you to say that, Monsieur, replied Cherasson, who, instead of waiting on the table, had seated himself in the chimney corner, this is an abominable inn, and they make you sleep with the dogs. Well, you good for not, isn't that good for you? retorted Monsieur Antoine in his sternest voice. You're very lucky not to be sent to perch with the hens. Deuce take it, you sybarite. You have straw to sleep on, but I suppose you are afraid of dying of hunger in the night, eh? Excuse me, Monsieur, the straw here is hay, and hay makes your headache. If that's so, you can lie on the floor at the foot of my bed to teach you to complain. You stand like a hunchback. So hard a bed like that will do you a deal of good. Go and prepare your master's bed and spread the horse blanket for Monsieur Sacrepant. Emile wondered what would be the end of this jest, which Monsieur Antoine seemed determined to carry on to the end with a sober face. And when Gilbert had gone to her room, he followed Monsieur Antoine to his to find out whether he would persuade his page to make the best of the straw. The Count amused himself by causing himself to be waited on like a man of quality. Come, he said, pull off my boots and give me a nightcap and put out the lights. You can stretch yourself on the bricks there and look out for yourself if you are unlucky enough to snore. Good night, Emile. Go to bed. You won't be vexed with the company of this rascal, who would prevent you from sleeping. He'll sleep on the floor to punish him for his absurd complaints. After about two hours' sleep, Emile was wakened with the start by the fall of a heavy body on the straw beside him. It's nothing. It's only I, said Monsieur Antoine. Don't let me disturb you. I undertook to share my bed with that good for naught, but my gentleman, on the plea that he is growing, must needs have the fidgets in his legs, and he kicked me so many times that I abandoned the field to him. Let him sleep in a bed, as he so set upon it. For my part, I shall be much more comfortable here. Such was the exemplary punishment which the page of Chateaubriand underwent at Frisseline. End of section 21《ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・アントワン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・ジョージ・サン・ヴァルミューレ・We will leave Emile to forget his appointment with Janelle and to wander over hill and dale with the object of his thoughts, and we will take up the thread of the events in which his destiny is involved at the Cardinet factory. Monsieur Cardinet was beginning to be seriously annoyed by Emile's continual absences and to say to himself that the time would soon come to keep watch on and regulate his actions. Now that his mind is diverted from his socialism, he thought, it is time for him to take hold of some profitable reality. Argument will have little effect on a mind so addicted to discussion. It seems that his hobby horse is in the stable for a while, and I won't do anything to make him take him out. 
but let us see if we cannot replace theories by practice. At his age, a man is led by instinct rather than by ideas, although he proudly fancies that the contrary is true. First of all, let us bind him down to some practical work and make him devote himself to it against his will, if necessary. He is too hard-working and intelligent not to do well what he is compelled to do. Gradually, whatever employment I may have provided for him will become a necessity to him. He was always like that. Even although he detested the study of the law, he learned the law. Very good. Let him finish his law studies, even if he is destined to hate it more and more and to relapse into the aberrations which have disturbed me so. I know now that it won't take very much time or a very clever coquette to rid him of the code of pedagogy of the new schools. But it was the middle of vacation, and Monsieur Cardinet had no immediate pretext for sending Emile back to Poitiers. Moreover, he had great hopes of his stay at Gargiles, for little by little Emile overcame his repugnance to the occupations which his father marked out for him from time to time and seemed to be no longer engrossed by the object for which he had fought so earnestly. All the work that Emile did, he did in a superior way, and Monsieur Cardinet flattered himself that he could drive love from his mind when he chose, without impairing the submission and the talents of which he sometimes reaped the fruits. Nothing was farther from Madame Cardinet's intention than to call her husband's attention to Emile's strange conduct. If she could have divined the joy which her son derived from absenting himself thus, and the secret of that joy, she would have assisted to save appearances, and with more affection than prudence would have become his accomplice. But she imagined that Monsieur Cardinet's manner, which was often cold and sarcastic, was the only cause of the discomfort Emile suffered in his father's house. And, nursing a secret grudge against her lord and master therefore, she suffered bitterly, because she enjoyed so little of her son's society. When Galouchet returned with the information that Monsieur Emile would not be home until the evening of the next day, or the next but one, she could not restrain her tears, and said in an undertone, now he has begun to pass the night away from home. He is not willing even to sleep here. He must be very unhappy. Upon my word, that's a pretty subject for lamentation, said Monsieur Cardinet with a shrug. Is your son a girl that you are so frightened for him to pass a night away from home? If you begin this way, you are not at the end of your troubles." for this is only the beginning of the escapades a young man is likely to indulge in. Constant, he said to his secretary when they were alone, who were the people in whose company you met my son? Oh, a very agreeable party, monsieur, monsieur Antoine de Chateaubrun, who is a high liver, a stout, jovial man, altogether agreeable in his manners, and his daughter, a superb woman with a perfect figure, the most attractive creature you can imagine. I see that you are a connoisseur, Galachet, and that you miss none of the damsel's charms. Dame, monsieur, when a man has eyes, he uses them, said Galachet with a loud laugh of satisfaction, for it very rarely happened that his employer did him the honor to talk with him on a subject unconnected with his duties. And it is with these same persons, I suppose, that my son continued his romantic excursions? I think so, monsieur, for I saw him in the distance on horseback, as if accompanying them. Have you ever been to Chateaubriand, Galichet? Yes, monsieur. I went there once when the masters were absent, and if I had known that I should find no one there but the old servant, I wouldn't have been such a fool. Why? Because I might have seen the chateau for nothing at another time, I have no doubt, whereas that old witch, after showing me around her den, demanded fifty centimes, monsieur, as the price of her condescension. It's a shame to bleed people for showing them such a ruin. I thought that old Antoine had made some repairs since I was there. Repairs, monsieur, 
It's a pitiful sight. They have rebuilt one corner, about as big as your hand, and they didn't even have money enough to put wallpapers on their rooms. The master isn't half so well lodged as I am in your house. It's a depressing place inside. Heaps of stones in the courtyard to break your legs over. Nettles, brambles, no door under a great archway that resembles the entrance to the Chateau of Vincennes, and which would be pretty enough if they would give it a coat of plaster of Paris, but all the rest in such a state. Not a wall secure, not a staircase that doesn't shake. Cracks big enough to hold a man. Ivy that they don't even take the pains to tear down, although it would be easy enough, and rooms that have neither floor nor ceiling. On my word, the people here about are genuine Gascons for boasting about their old chateau and sending you about on breakneck roads to find what? Ruins and thistles. Crozant is a stupendous fraud, and Chateaubriand is little better than Crozant. So you were not charmed with Crozant either? But my son seems to like it immensely. I'll be bound. Monsieur Emile might very well like it with such a pretty slip of a girl on his arm. If I had been in his shoes, I shouldn't have complained over much about the place. But for my part, as I went there hoping to catch a trout, and didn't get as much as the gudgeon, I am not very well satisfied with my walk, especially as it is twenty kilometers each way, making four myriameters on foot. Are you tired, Galichet? Yes, monsieur, very tired, and very dissatisfied. They'll never catch me in their Moorish king's fortress again. And Galichet, recalling with pride his jest of the morning, repeated complacently and with a cunning smile. Those kings must have cut a curious figure. Doubtless they wore clogs and ate with their fingers. You are very bright tonight, Galichet, rejoined Monsieur Cardinet, not deigning to smile. But smitten as you are, if you were brighter, you would find some pretext for calling on old Chateaubriand from time to time. I need no pretext, Monsieur replied Galichet in an important tone. I am well acquainted with him. He has often invited me to fish in his stream, and again today he urged me to go to breakfast with him some Sunday. Very well. Why don't you go? I am glad to allow you a little recreation from time to time. You are too kind, monsieur. If you don't need me, I will go next Sunday, for I am very fond of fishing. Galichet, my boy, you are an idiot. What's that, monsieur? said Galichet, disconcerted. I tell you, my dear fellow, you are an idiot, Cardinet calmly repeated. You think of nothing but catching gudgeons when you might be paying court to a pretty girl. Oh, I don't know about that, monsieur, said Galichet, scratching his ear with a fatuous air. I should like the girl well enough, that's true. She's a jewel. Blue eyes, fair hair that's a meter and a half long, I'll wager superb teeth, and a mischievous little glance. I could be dead in love with her if I chose. And why don't you choose? Dame, if I had ten thousand francs of my own, I might suit her. But when one has nothing, one is hardly a suitable match for a girl who has nothing. Is your salary equal to her income? Why, her income is contingent. An old Janille, who is supposed to be her mother, I must confess it, it would be a little distasteful to me to be the son-in-law of a servant. Old Janille would certainly insist on a small sum to begin housekeeping with. Do you think ten thousand francs would be enough? I have no idea, but it seems to me that those people have no right to be very ambitious. Their hovel isn't worth four thousand francs. The mountain, the garden, a bit of meadow on the edge of the stream, all overgrown with rushes, and the orchard where there are some fruit trees good for nothing but to burn. All those together wouldn't bring a hundred francs a year. They say Monsieur Antoine has a little capital in government securities. It can't be much, judging from the life they lead. But if I were sure of a thousand francs a year... I would arrange matters with the girl. She pleases me, and I am old enough to settle down. 
Monsieur Antoine has twelve hundred francs a year, I know. Reverting to his daughter, Monsieur? I am sure of it. But although he has recognized her, she is a natural daughter and entitled to only half of it. Well, do you feel that you can aspire to her hand now? Thanks, Monsieur. What are we to live on and bring up children? Of course, you would need a little capital. We might be able to find that for you, Galachet, if your happiness absolutely depended on it. I do not know how to acknowledge your kindness, monsieur, but... But what? Come, don't scratch your ear so much, but answer. I don't dare, monsieur. Why not? Don't I talk to you as if I were your friend? I am deeply touched by it, rejoined Galachet, but... But you annoy me. Speak in heaven's name. Well, monsieur, even if you should call me a fool again, I will say what I think. I think that monsieur Emile is paying court to that young lady. Do you mean it? exclaimed monsieur Cardinet, feigning surprise. If monsieur is not aware of it, I should be very sorry to be the cause of trouble between him and his son. Is there any common rumor to that effect? I don't know whether people are talking about it. I pay little attention to gossip, but I myself have noticed that Monsieur Emile goes to Chateaubron very often. What does that prove? That is as Monsieur may choose to think, and it is all the same to me. I simply meant to say that if I had any idea of marrying a young woman, I should not be very well pleased to come in second. I can imagine that but it is hardly likely that my son would pay serious attention to a young woman whom he neither would nor could marry. My son has lofty sentiments. He would never descend to a falsehood, to false promises. If the girl is virtuous, be assured that her relations with Emile are entirely innocent. Isn't that your opinion? I will have whatever opinion Monsieur may desire on that subject. That is altogether too accommodating. If you were in love with Mademoiselle de Chateaubron, wouldn't you try to find out the truth for yourself? Certainly, monsieur, but I could hardly be in love with her, having seen her but once. Well, listen to me, Galichet. You can do me a service. What you have just told me makes me a little more anxious than it makes you, and all that we have been saying by way of conjecture and jest, will have, at all events, the serious result of having warned me of certain dangers. I tell you again that my son is too honorable a man to seduce a penniless, inexperienced girl, but it might happen to him, if he sees her too often, to conceive for her somewhat too warm a feeling, which would expose them both to temporary but unnecessary suffering. It would be very easy for me to cut the whole thing off short by sending Emile away at once, but that would interfere with the plan I have formed of training him to share my occupations, and I regret to be compelled for so unimportant a reason to part with him under present circumstances. Consent, therefore, to help me. You are sure of a warm welcome at Chateaubron. Go there often, as often as my son. Make yourself the friend of the family. Père Antoine's unsuspecting nature will assist you. Look about you, observe, and report to me all that happens. If your presence annoys my son, it will be a proof that the danger exists. If he tries to have you turned out, stand your ground and pose unhesitatingly as an aspirant to the young lady's hand. And what if I am accepted? So much the better for you. That depends, monsieur, on how far things have gone between her and your son. You must be very simple, if with time and address you can't find out about that, as you are going there in the quality of an observer. And suppose I find that I have arrived too late. You will retire. I shall have made a ridiculous campaign, and Monsieur Emile will bear me a grudge for it. Galochet, I don't ask anything for nothing. Certainly, all this can't be done without some ennui and some unpleasantness for you. 
but there's a good bonus at the end of all the sacrifices I ask you to make. That's enough, monsieur, and I have only one other word to say, and that is that, in case the girl should suit me, and I should suit her too, I should be too poor at this moment to go to housekeeping. We have already anticipated that contingency. I would assist you to make a position for yourself. For example, you undertake to work for me for a certain time, and I make you an advance of 5,000 francs on your salary, and a bonus of 5,000 francs in addition, if necessary. This is no longer a jest, a conjecture, I suppose, said Galochet, scratching his head harder than ever. I don't often jest, as you know, and this time I am not jesting at all. Very good, monsieur, you are too kind to me. I will plant myself beside Monsieur Almille, and he will be very shrewd if I lose sight of him. He will be shrewder than you, and that will not be difficult, thought Monsieur Cardinet, as soon as Galichet had retired. But a rival of your sort will be enough to make him feel humiliated by his choice very soon, and if she prefers a dull lout like you for a husband to a handsome chance suitor like him, he will have received a useful lesson. In that event, a trifling sacrifice from Monsieur Galichet's establishment would not be draining the sea dry, especially as that would keep him in my service and cut short his ambition to leave me. But that is the worst possible result of my plan, and Galichet has twenty chances to one of being shown the door sooner or later. Meanwhile, I shall have had time to think of something better, and I shall, at all events, have succeeded in worrying Emile, in disenchanting him, in fastening to his sides an enemy whom he will hardly know how to combat, ennui in the shape of constant galouchet. Cardinet's idea did not lack depth, and if it had not been too soon or too late for Emile to renounce his illusions, it might have been successful. Any sort of competition stimulates vulgar minds, but a refined mind suffers from an unworthy rivalry. An exalted nature will infallibly be disgusted with the being who takes pleasure in the homage of stupidity. The mere fact that the object of his adoration tolerates such homage too patiently may be enough to cause him to blush and take himself away. But Cardinet reckoned without Gilbert's pride. Emile returned from his excursion more inflamed with passion than ever, and in such a state of blissful enthusiasm that it seemed to him impossible that he should not triumph over everything. The generous Gilbert had powerfully assisted his illusion by sharing it, and therein she had shown herself, by her lack of prudence and her openness of heart, the worthy child of Antoine. Emile might well have reproached himself, however, for having gone so far with her without having first made sure of Monsieur Cardinet's consent. That was a terrible imprudence. Indeed, it was culpable rashness, for unless a miracle should happen, he could reckon on his father's refusal. But Emile was in that state of delirious excitement in which one reckons on miracles and deems himself almost a god because he is loved. However, he returned to Gargilles without having made up his mind at what moment he would announce his sentiments to his family, for Gilbert had insisted that he should do nothing suddenly, and had received his promise to begin by gradually appealing to the affection of his parents by governing his conduct in accordance with their wishes. Thus, Emile was to make amends for an absence which had doubtless caused them some anxiety by staying with them all the rest of the week and working zealously at whatever his father chose to give him to do. You must not come to see us until next Sunday, Gilbert had said when they parted, and then we will arrange our plans for the following week. The poor child felt that she must live from day to day, and like Emile, she derived infinite pleasure from caressing in her thoughts the mystery of a love of which they alone realized the charm and the depth. 
Emil kept his word. He did not absent himself from home during the week, and contented himself with writing Monsieur de bois an affectionate letter to set his mind at rest concerning his sentiments, in case the suspicious old man should take alarm because he did not see him. He followed his father like a shadow. He even asked him for employment, and devoted himself to the construction of the factory like one who took the deepest interest in the success of the undertaking. But as it is not natural to do violence to one's own heart for long, it was impossible for him to push the indolent workman. Monsieur Cardinet derived no sort of benefit from the employment of men of that description. They lacked energy, and the rivalry of the more active produced discouragement in them instead of emulation. They were well paid, but as they saw from the master's dissatisfaction that they would not be retained long, they determined to make the most of the present, and consequently economized in their food. When Emile saw them sitting on the damp stones with their feet in the mud, eating a piece of black bread and raw onions like the Hebrew slaves employed in building the pyramids, he had such a feeling of compassion for them that he would have preferred giving them his own blood to drink to abandoning them to that slow death of toil and starvation. Thereupon, he tried to persuade his father, since he could not save all those numerous lives, to afford them at all events some temporary relief by feeding them better than they fed themselves, or by giving them at least a little wine. But Monsieur Cardinet reminded him, only too justly, that as all the vines were frozen in the preceding year, they could not obtain wine in that country except at a very high price, and that it was for the table of the bourgeois only. Where no general system of economy was practiced, it was easy to prove that economy in special directions was powerless to bring about any important amelioration, and to demonstrate, by the unanswerable evidence of figures, that they must either abandon the idea of building or compel the mechanic to undergo the unpleasant necessities of his position. Monsieur Cardinet did his utmost to remedy the evil, but that utmost was confined within narrow limits. Emile submitted and sighed. He could give Gilbert no stronger proof of his love than to hold his peace. Well, said Monsieur Cardinet, I see that you will never be very sharp in the matter of superintending. But when I am no longer in this world, it will be enough if you realize the need of having a good superintendent in my place. The material part of the work is the least poetic. You will find your field of activity in the direction of art and science, which have their place in manufacturing as in everything else. Come to my study. Help me to understand the things that escape my comprehension and place your genius at the service of my energy. During that week, Emile had to read, to study, to comprehend, and to summarize several works on hydrostatics. Monsieur Cardinet did not think that he really needed to have that work done, but it was one way of testing Emile, and he was overjoyed by his rapidity and mental keenness. Such studies would arouse no disgust in a mind occupied with theories. Anything connected with science may have some useful application in the future, and when one has not under his eyes the deplorable conditions through which social inequity compels the men of the present day to pass, in the execution of any work, he may well become deeply interested in the abstract theories of science." Monsieur Cardinet recognized Emile's lofty intelligence and said to himself that with such eminent faculties it was not possible that he would always close his eyes to what he called evidence. When Sunday arrived, it seemed to Emile that a century had passed since he had last seen that enchanted palace of Chateaubriand, where in his eyes nature was lovelier, the air softer, and the light more glorious than in any spot on earth. He began with Bois-Gilbeau, however, for he remembered that Constant Galichet was to breakfast at Chateaubriand, and he hoped 
that uninteresting individual would have departed or would be busy with his fishing when he arrived. But he was far from anticipating Monsieur Constant's Machiavellism. He found him still at table with Monsieur Antoine, a little overburdened by the native wine to which he was not accustomed, shuffling about on his chair and making commonplace remarks, while Gilbert, sitting in the courtyard, waited impatiently until a relaxation of vigilance on Janille's part should enable her to go out on the terrace and watch for her lover's coming. But Janille did not relax her vigilance. She was prowling about in every corner of the ruins and was on the spot to receive half the salutation which Emile addressed to Gilbert. But Emile saw at first glance that she had said nothing. Really, monsieur, she said, lisping with more affectation than usual, you are not polite, and you have nearly caused a rival's quarrel between my girl and me. What? You lead me to hope that you will come and keep me company in her absence? You even go so far as to appoint a day. And then, instead of coming here, you go and enjoy yourself taking an excursion with Mademoiselle on the pretext that she is forty years younger than me? As if that was my fault, and as if I am not as light of foot and as lively to talk with as a mere girl. It was very rude on your part, and you have done well to let my anger lie for a few days, for if you had come sooner, you would have had a very cold reception. Hasn't Monsieur Antoine justified me, rejoined Emile, by telling you how entirely unforeseen our meeting at Croson was, and that our trip to Saint-Germain was suggested by him on the spur of the moment? Forgive me, dear Mademoiselle Chanille, and be sure that nothing less than being ten leagues away would have induced me to break my appointment with you. I know, I know, said Janille in a meaning tone, that it was Monsieur Antoine who did all the harm. He is so inconsiderate, but I should have thought that you would be more reasonable. I am very reasonable, my dear Janelle, replied Emile in the same tone and I have proved it by passing the week with my father, working to please him, in spite of my longing to come and obtain my pardon. And you did well, my boy, for it is a good thing for young men to be employed. You will be satisfied with me hereafter, said Emile, glancing at Gilbert, and my father has already forgiven me for the time I have wasted. He is very kind to me, and I will show my appreciation of his kindness by forcing myself to undergo the most painful sacrifices, even that of seeing you a little less frequently, henceforth, Mademoiselle Chanille. So scold me today quickly, but not too hard, and forgive me even more quickly, for I shall probably be able to come here very seldom for several weeks. I have much work to do, and my courage would fail me if I knew that you were angry with me. Well, well, you are a good boy, and no one can bear you a grudge, said Janille. I see, she added with a knowing air, lowering her voice, that we understand each other perfectly without any further explanation, and that it's a good thing to have people of honor and good sense like you to deal with. This result of the explanations threatened by Chenille relieved Emile from a great anxiety. His position was quite serious enough, without being complicated by the alarms and questions of that faithful retainer. The advice Gilbert had given him to come more rarely and to let time do its work was thus proved to be most judicious, and if she had been a trained diplomatist, she could not have acted more shrewdly on that occasion. In very truth, how many marriages between persons of unequal fortune would become possible did not the woman by her exactions, her pride or her suspicion, involve the man enamored of her in a labyrinth of suffering and anxiety amid which his prudence and courage in overcoming obstacles fail him. With Gilbert's childlike innocence was blended calm common sense and unselfish courage, she did not look upon her union with Emile as possible 
until after several years, and she felt that her love was strong enough to wait. That cruel future appeared to her heart overflowing with faith, like a day radiant with sunshine, and therein she was not so foolish as some might think. It is faith and not prudence that moves mountains. End of section 22 Chapter 23 of The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1, by Georges Sand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love. The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1, by Georges Sand. Translated by George Burnham Ives. The Devil's Rock. Emile had forgotten even Constant Galichet's name when he found himself once more within the walls of the dear old chateau, and when he went in to salute Monsieur Antoine, the stupid features of his father's clerk produced the same effect upon him that a caterpillar produces upon one who puts out his hand unsuspiciously to pluck a fruit. Galichet had prepared to greet Emile with the assured air of a man who has taken possession first of a coveted seat, and who can afford an affable greeting to those who come too late. A little more, and he would have done the honors of the chateau to Emile. But the young man's cold and mocking glance, as he replied to his familiar and effusive salutation, disconcerted him sadly. That glance seemed to say to him, what are you doing here? Meanwhile, Galichet, who thought much more of earning Monsieur Cardinet's liberality than of winning Gilbert's good graces, made a mighty effort to recover his self-possession, and his face, while not expressing actual hostility, assumed an unaccustomed air of insolence which was, under the circumstances, as injudicious as possible. Emile had determined to make the best of the native wine, and in order not to offend Monsieur de Chateaubrun, he did not refuse to drink with him on his arrival. It may be that, by virtue of the utter fascination which took possession of him in the place where Gilbert passed her days, he really considered that thin, sour beverage better than all the choice wines in his father's cellar but on this occasion it seemed bitter to him when Galichet, assuming the air of a man who condescends to howl with the wolves, put out his glass toward his, proposing to touch glasses after the manner of Monsieur de Chateaubriand. He accompanied this familiarity with an unpleasantly vulgar movement of the elbow and shoulder, thinking to imitate in jovial mood Monsieur Antoine's patriarchal simplicity. Monsieur le Comte, said Emile, ostentatiously treating Antoine with even more respect than usual, I fear that you have induced Monsieur Constant Galichet to drink too much. See how red his eyes are and how he stares? Be careful. I warn you that his head is very weak. My head weak, Monsieur Emile? Why do you say that my head is weak? retorted Galichet. You have never seen me drunk, so far as I know. This will be the first time that I shall have had that pleasure if you continue to drink as you are doing. So it would give you pleasure to see me commit an impropriety? I trust that will not happen if you follow my advice. Very good, said Galichet, rising. If Monsieur Antoine cares to take a walk, I shall be glad to offer my arm to Mademoiselle Joubert, and then you can see if I walk crooked. I prefer not to risk the experiment, said Gilbert, who was sitting at the door of the pavilion, caressing Monsieur Sacrepant. So you take sides against me too, Mademoiselle Gilbert, rejoined Galichet, walking toward her. Do you believe what Monsieur Emile says? My daughter takes sides against no one, Monsieur, said Genille, and I don't understand why you bother your head about somebody who doesn't bother her head about you. If you forbid her to take my arm, replied Galichet, I have nothing to say. It seems to me, however, that it's no breach of true French courtesy to offer a young lady your arm. 
My mother does not forbid me to accept your arm, monsieur, said Gilbert, sweetly, but with much dignity. But I thank you for your courtesy. I am not a Parisian. I can hardly appreciate the custom of taking a support in walking. Besides, our paths do not permit that custom. Your paths are no worse than those at Crozon, and the rougher they are, the more need there is for people to help one another. I saw you plainly enough at Crozon. Put your lovely hand on Monsieur Emile's shoulder to go down the mountain. Oh, I saw it, Mademoiselle Gilbert, and I would have liked right well to be in his place. Monsieur Galochet, if you had not drunk beyond all reason, said Emile, you would not concern yourself about me, and I beg you not to concern yourself about me at all. Hoity, toity, now you are losing your temper, are you? said Galochet, trying to adopt a good-natured tone. Everybody is hard on me here, except Monsieur Antoine. Perhaps that is because you are a little too familiar with everybody, retorted Emile. What's going on here? said Jean Chapleau, entering the room. Are you quarreling? Here am I to make peace. Good day, Mami Chenille. Good day, my Gilbert du bon Dieu. Good day, friend Emile. Good day, Antoine, my master. And good day, you, he said to Galachet. I don't know you, but it's all the same. Ah, it's Père Cardinet's man of business. Ah, good day to you, my dear Monsieur Sacrepant. I didn't notice your greeting. Vive Dieu, cried Antoine, better late than never, but do you know, Jean, you are going wrong? When we only have one day a week to see you, and God knows how long the week is without you, you get here at noon on Sunday. Listen, master, I don't want you to call me master. What if I choose to call you so? I was your master long enough, and it would be a bore to me to give orders all the time. Now I choose to be your apprentice for a little change. Come give me something fresh and cool to drink, quickly, Chanille. I am warm, not that I am hungry. They wouldn't let me go after mass, my good friends at Gargilles. I must needs stop and chatter a little with Mère La Rose, and you can't keep your throat from getting dry when you talk without drinking. But I came fast, because I knew you would be thinking about me here. You see, Gilbert, since I came back to the old place, the Sunday would have to be forty-eight hours long to allow me to satisfy all the friends who are glad to see me. Well, my dear Jean, if you are happy, that consoles us a little for seeing you less often, said Gilbert. Happy, rejoined the carpenter, there's no happier man than I on the face of the earth. That's easy to see, said Chenille. See how he has cheered up since he ceased to be tracked every morning like an old rabbit? And then he shaves every Sunday now, and he has new clothes that look very well on him. And who was it who spun the wool for this pretty drugget? said Jean. Why, Mamie Janille and the good Lord's child. And who gave the wool? My master's sheep. And who paid the cost? It is paid in friendship here. You don't have coats like this, bourgeois. I wouldn't change my Faustian jacket for your black broadcloth swallowtail. I would be satisfied with the spinstress, observed Galochet, glancing at Gilbert. You, said Jean, good-humouredly, bringing his hand down on Galochet's shoulder with force enough to crush an ox. You have spinstresses like this one? Why, Mami Janille is too young for you, my boy. And as for the other, I would kill her if she should spin a bit of wool as long as your nose for you. Galochet was wounded by this allusion to his flat nose, and retorted, rubbing his shoulder. Look, you peasant, your manners are too touching. Joke with your equals. I have nothing to say to you. What's this gentleman's name? Jean asked Monsieur Antoine. I can't remember his devil of a name. Come, come, Jean, you go a little too fast, old fellow, replied Monsieur Antoine. Don't undertake to tease Monsieur Galochet. He's a very worthy young man, and furthermore, he is my guest. Well said, master. Let us make peace, Monsieur Maljuchet. Will you have a pinch of snuff? I don't use it, replied Galochet haughtily. 
With Monsieur Antoine's permission, I will leave the table. At your pleasure, young man, at your pleasure, said the Chatelaine. Monsieur Emile doesn't enjoy long sessions either, and you can stroll about a bit. Janille will show you the chateau, or, if you prefer to go down to the brook, get your lines ready. We will join you directly, and take you where you will find good sport. Oh, yes, said the carpenter. He's a fisher of small fry. He does nothing else every evening at Gargiles, and when anyone speaks to him, he makes a wry face because it disturbs his fish. Well, we will go directly and help him to catch something better than his small fry. Look you, Monsieur Malgerset, if I don't put you in the way of carrying home a salmon for your supper, I'll agree to change names with you. You don't need to be in such a hurry. The boat should be in good condition, for I nailed a plank in its belly not long ago. We'll find an old harpoon somewhere, and the Devil's Rock, where the salmon usually go to take a nap in the sun, isn't far away. But it's a dangerous place, and you must not go alone. We will all go, said Chilbert. If Jean manages the boat, it's very interesting sport, and the place itself is magnificent. Oh, if you are coming, Mademoiselle Gilbert, I will await your pleasure, said Galochet. Hear that! Wouldn't anyone think she was going on your account, paper scratcher? This youngster is impertinent beyond everything. Is everybody like that where you come from? Oh, don't put on that indignant expression and look over your shoulder, for it doesn't frighten me much. If you choose to be agreeable, I will be too. But if, just because you are dressed in black like a notary, you think you can leave the table when I remain, you are much mistaken. Sit down, sit down, Malouche. I haven't finished drinking, and you are going to drink with me. I have had enough, said Galouche, resisting. I tell you, I have had enough. But the carpenter would have broken him in two like a lath rather than let him go. He forced him to sit down again on the bench and swallow several more bumpers. Galouche, striving to show a bold front to evil fortune, and Monsieur Antoine, shielding him ineffectually against his old friend's malicious shafts, although he did not share the antipathy which the secretary's face and manners aroused in the rest of the family. Emile had slowly followed Gilbert and Janil into the courtyard, and despite the little old woman's jealous watchfulness, he had succeeded in telling his sweetheart that he had obeyed her orders zealously, and that he found his father in such a favorable frame of mind that he could safely risk some overture in the following week. But Gilbert thought that the risk would be too great, and urged him to persevere in that sedentary, laborious life. Courage seemed easy to them both. Now that Emile was sure that he was loved, he was so happy that he thought that he could demand nothing more of fortune for a long time. There was a divine tranquility in the depths of his heart. Gilbert's clear and searching glance said so many things to him now. There is, in the dawn of a lover's happiness, a moment of tranquil beatitude, when the most penetrating observer would have difficulty in detecting the secret on the surface. The desire to see and speak to each other every hour seems to disappear with the anxious longing to reach an understanding. When their hearts are bound together by a mutual avowal, neither witnesses nor separation can embarrass them or part them in reality. Thus the clear-sighted Chenille was deceived by their peaceful merriment and by the prudence which comes only when suffering and doubt are at an end. The perturbation which Chenille had often noticed in young Cardinet, the sudden flush that rose to Gilbert's cheeks at certain words of which she alone had grasped the meaning, her sadness and her ill-designed agitation when he was late in coming, all had vanished since the trip to Croissant, and Chenille was amazed that an incident the consequences of which she had dreaded had caused a favorable change in the state of affairs. I was mistaken, she said to herself. My girl is not thinking too much about him, and if he thinks of her, he will know enough to say nothing, and draw back little by little, rather than endanger our repose. He is behaving well, 
and it would be a pity to hurt his feelings, since he understood me with half a word, and is carrying out my wishes of his own accord. If Jean Japlou had conspired with Emile to take vengeance on Galichet for his pretensions, he could have done no better than he did, for during more than an hour, while the lovers were strolling about with Janiel in the neighborhood of the pavilion, he employed sometimes cunning raillery, sometimes open force, to keep him at the table and make him drink willy-nilly. In this test, which was beyond his strength, Galichet soon lost the little good sense with which nature had endowed him. He was much scandalized at first by the Chatelaine's habits, and conceived a profound contempt for him, whom he regarded as the court's companion in debauchery. In a word, Galichet, who had no trace of elevation in his feelings or his ideas, and who was not worth a single hair from the heads of those two rough-spoken worthies, deemed himself degraded, and promised himself that he would, in his report to his master, depict in startling colors the painful task he had undertaken. But as he drank, his wits went astray altogether, his vulgar instincts gained the upper hand of his secret vanity, and he began to laugh, to pound on the table, to talk loud, to boast of innumerable feats of valor, and to make such a pitiful exhibition of himself that Japlou, who was as refined as his manners were abrupt, took compassion on him and gave him a severe lecture with a cold and serious air. "'You don't know how to drink, my friend,' he said. "'You are ugly when you laugh, and you are stupid when you try to be witty. If I ventured to give Monsieur Antoine a piece of advice, it would be to give you a glass of water when you come to breakfast with him. Otherwise you might make remarks before his daughter that would force me to put you out of doors. You thought, when you saw us all so merry and so unceremonious with one another, that we were vulgar folk and that you must become vulgar to descend to our level. You made a mistake. Whoever has nothing evil in his heart or unclean in his mind can let himself go. And even if I should be so drunk that I couldn't stand, I shouldn't be afraid that I could be made to blush the next day for anything I had said. It seems that it's not the same with you. That is why you do well to dress in black from head to foot and make people who don't know you think you're a gentleman. For if there is a peasant here, you are the man. Antoine tried to soften the sermon, and Galichet tried to get angry. Jean shrugged his shoulders and left the table to avoid having to give him a lesson more appropriate to the state of his intellect. When they left the pavilion, Galichet was still walking straight, but his head was so heavy and so heated that he dared not utter a word before Gilbert for fear of saying one thing for another. Well, said Gilbert to Japlou, are we going to the Devil's Rock? It's more than a year since I was there. Chanel will never let father take me there because she says it's too dangerous and one can't afford to be absent-minded there. But she will let me go with you, my good Jean. Do you feel that your hand is still strong and your eye sure enough? I, said Chapleau, why, I feel as well equal to the task as if I were no more than twenty-five. And you are not tipsy, said Janiel, taking hold of Jean's sleeve and standing on tiptoe to look into his eyes. Look, look all you please, said he. If you can do this, I will agree that I am tipsy. And he placed on his head a pitcher of water that Janiel was carrying and ran several yards without upsetting it. Very good, said Janiel. I could do as much if I chose, but it's no use, I am sure of you and I trust my girl with you. For my part, I haven't the time to go along. Do you, Monsieur Emile, just keep an eye on the father, for he is quite capable of trying to step ashore in midstream if he is busy laughing or talking. And who will keep an eye on Maluchet? queried Chapleau, pointing to Galouchet, who had gone ahead with Monsieur Antoine. I won't be responsible for him. Nor I, said Gilbert, Never fear, said Emile, I will undertake to keep him quiet. It's not at all certain that you will succeed, rejoined Jean. If he isn't drunk, he's something like it. 
You can't say that he's downright rich, but he's just comfortable. A bed would be better for him than a boat. You can notice how he goes down the mountain, suggested Chenille, and if there's danger of his sinking you, leave him on the rocks on the bank. Galichet was already in the boat with Monsieur de Chateaubriand when the others arrived. He was flushed and silent. But when they were in midstream, the swift current made him dizzy, and he began to sway so violently from side to side that Chapleau, losing his patience, took a rope and bound his body securely to the thwart on which he sat. He fell asleep in that position. "'You have a delightful secretary there,' said Gilbert to Emile. "'I trust, dear Papa, that you won't invite him to breakfast again.' Oh, bless my soul, it's not his fault, replied Monsieur Antoine, but Jean's, who made him drink more than he wanted. What does a man amount to who can't drink without getting drunk, said Jean. He's worse than nobody. The boat glided swiftly downstream to a spot where the rocks on each side approached so nearly that it was impossible to pass without great danger. Jean was one of the most powerful men in the province. His fearless nature and his strong will added tenfold to his physical strength. He was accustomed to enter into the most trivial undertakings with as much passionate enthusiasm as if he were setting out to conquer the world. And yet, notwithstanding this youthful excitability, his presence of mind was wonderful. He guided the boat in the center of the current, and when they entered the narrow passage, threw her across the stream and avoided the shock of a collision with the cliff by leaning out and grasping it with his hand. Emile, who seconded him, gallantly relieved him from time to time, and the boat being thus held in place, they made ready the harpoon and waited in silence for the prey to pass. Everyone knows that the fish always try to swim up against the current, but they were frightened by the unusual barrier and kept approaching and retreating. The lookout leaned forward, stretching his arms as far as he could. Monsieur Antoine and Gilbert, kneeling behind him, watched to see that the movement he made in throwing the harpoon did not sink the boat or drag him overboard. Gilbert, when it was the carpenter's turn, clung to his coat, fearing that he would fall into the water, and when Emile's turn came, she earnestly urged her father to hold him with all his strength. But soon, trusting to no one else, she seized his jacket herself, and more than once he felt the touch of her lovely arms, ready to embrace him in case of accident. In this situation, which was dangerous for all, Jean's attention and Antoine's was completely absorbed by the excitement of fishing, and the same excitement served the two lovers as a pretext for exchanging glances and words, which Galouchet, although half awake, was in no condition to observe. What would Monsieur Carnet have thought could he have seen how well his agent was earning his reward? At last a salmon was speared amid frantic shouts from Jean Japlou, and Galouchet, partly aroused by the sight of the capture, tried to take a hand in landing him but his clumsiness and obstinacy spoiled everything, and Jean, beside himself with wrath, turned the boat around, saying, When you want to fish for salmon, you will go with somebody besides me. Gudgeons of this size aren't in your line, and if we stayed here long, I should break your head with the shaft of my harpoon. God preserve me from coming again with such a bore as you, retorted Galichet, sitting on the edge of the boat. Don't sit there, said the carpenter. You are in my way, and you would do much better to help me pull up against this current, which runs like a mill race. Here is Monsieur Emile, working like a good fellow, and you, stout and strong as you are, fold your arms and watch the sweat roll off us. Faith, it's your own fault, retorted Galouchet. You made me drink, and I am good for nothing. Very good, but you are heavy and as you are not working, you can go ashore. To the bank, to the bank, my little Emile. Let us get rid of bundles that are in the way. They headed for the shore, but Galouchet considered the proposed step insulting, and refused to land, blaspheming in the most reckless way. Ten thousand devils, cried Chapleau, thoroughly angry. 
You have made me lose a superb salmon, but you shan't make me break my back in your service. And he pushed him out of the boat. But Galachet, because he resisted, fell between the boat and the bank, into the water, up to his waist. Faith, that's well done, said Chapleau. That'll put a little water in your wine. And he pulled the boat rapidly out of Galachet's reach, for in his rage he tried to upset her. Ah, the miserable fellow, cried the carpenter. Confess that if there are some good beasts, there are many vicious ones. Let him wallow, he said to his companions, who feared that poor Galouchet, because of his fuddled condition, might drown, although the water was not dangerously deep. If he sinks too far, I'll stick my harpoon in his belt and fish him up like a salmon. Bah! If it were anything of value, we might have reason to be anxious. But things that are good for nothing, dead cats and empty bottles, always float. In a few moments, Galachet jumped up on the bank, shook his fist, and vanished. This ridiculous incident depressed Gilbert. For the first time, she detected a serious inconvenience in her father's too great good nature. His rustic and simple manners, which were those of the people about him and were the expression of a kindly and innocent nature, began to terrify her as not affording such enlightened and judicious protection as her age and sex demanded. I am a poor country girl, she said to herself, and I can get along very well with peasants, but on the condition that no ill-bred semi-bourgeois undertakes to interfere for then the peasants become a little too violent in their wrath, and the life I lead does not put me out of reach of a coward's revenge. Thereupon she thought of Emile as a protector destined for her by heaven, but she asked herself amid what surroundings he himself was compelled to live, and the idea that Monsieur Cardinet employed people of the Galichet species caused her a sort of vague alarm with regard to his character and habits. When Jean Japlou returned to Garden Lease that evening, he found Galouchet lying like a dead man in the middle of the road. The poor devil, sobered momentarily by the bath he had taken, had entered a wine shop to dry his clothes, and as he was afraid of his health, he had allowed himself to be persuaded to take a glass of eau de vie, which had finished him. He was returning home literally on all fours, Jean had had time to forget his anger, nor was he the man to leave a fellow man in danger of being trampled upon by horse's feet. He lifted him up, submitted patiently to his threats and insults, and led him, more than half carrying him, to the factory, and Galouchet, who did not recognize him, went in, swearing that he would be revenged on the scoundrel who had tried to drown him. End of chapter 23 End of The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, Volume 1, by Georges Sand, translated by George Burnham Ives.